نحمد و نستعین و نستغفر و نعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا و من سیئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له و من يضلل فلا هادي له و اشهد و لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له و اشهد ان محمدا عبده و رسوله و استرائي نان كن قائد And I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last messenger of Allah. Inna asdaq al-hadithi kitabullah, indeed, the most truthful form of speech is the book of Allah. Wa khayru hadi hadyu Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the best source of guidance is that brought by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sharra al-umuri muhdathatuha. And the worst of all affairs are the innovations in religion. فَكُلُّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ For every innovation in religion is a cursed innovation. وَكُلُّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ And every cursed innovation is a source of misguidance. وَكُلُّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ And every form of misguidance ultimately leads to the hellfire. The topic of Our lecture series is Ibn Taymiyyah's essay on the heart. It is a book, uh, we could say really a, an essay or a treatise written by Ibn Taymiyyah uh, and which currently is a part of the Fatawa, the Majmu' al-Fatawa, which has uh, many, many volumes combining the various works of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and as a separate uh, risala or, let, or treatise it was published, edited by Shaykh Salim al-Hilali uh, and um, that is the version which I will be basing this uh, class or course on. Uh, Shaykh Salim basically referenced the Quranic verses, most of the Quranic verses and hadiths and what I have done basically is to translate the main text and I'll be giving a commentary on the uh, hadiths and the, and the text itself as well as um, finding the sources for those hadiths or Quranic verses which Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned and which uh, Shaykh Salim uh, was not able to find or missed. Now, the topic of course on the heart is a topic which is very important uh, for Muslims because of its central uh, position with regards to Iman, faith in general. So the topic uh, on the heart is not a medical topic We'll not be looking at how the heart works and functions from a medical perspective, but we'll be looking at it from a spiritual perspective, its relationship with Iman. But before looking at what Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah has written, I would just like to uh, introduce uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah uh, with some detail as to his background, who he was, scholar from the 13th century, who probably more than any other individual scholar from that period till now has influenced uh, scholars around the Muslim world to return to the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the early generation, that of the Sahaba and those who came after them. He single-handedly, uh, from his period onwards, there were earlier scholars, of course, great scholars of the past, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, you know, uh, Imam al-Shafi, uh, and others who were involved in that same process. But after the period of decline of Islamic law, you know, where in the 13th century we had the sacking of Baghdad by the Mongols and they're, you know, destroying much of Islamic literature, killing many of the scholars, etc. Uh, you could say Islamic law fell into a slump 
and uh, the various forces which led to the blind following of the schools of Islamic law had become very strong after that period. So much so that the scholars of the early 13th century uh, uh, basically ruled that it was not permissible for a person to switch his madhab. If he was a Shafi'i, he had to live and die a Shafi'i. It was illegal for him to become a Hanafi or to switch from one madhab to the other. And it was even given uh, the, the, the judges in the courts had the right to assign punishment for switching one's madhab. That's the state that the situation had reached. So Ibn Taymiyyah uh, was the loudest voice of that period calling to uh, the pure, the early understanding of Islam which was propagated by the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu whom if we were to ask Abu Huraira or Abu Bakr or Omar or Uthman or Ali or any of the leading Sahaba if we were to ask what was their madhab of course, we're not going to hear Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, or Hanbali. You know, their way, their understanding is the correct understanding. They followed the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that is what is obligatory on all Muslims. So, Ibn Taymiyyah, as you said, was the leading figure in reviving that understanding of Islam without the, uh, you could say, damaging effects of rigid following of the madhabs. Now, he was born in 1263 and his family migrated from Damascus as a result of the attacks by the descendants of the Mongols attacking that area, uh, they set, they shifted uh, from the area where he was in Iraq. He was born in the area called Edessa, which is currently a part of southern uh, Turkey. The town is now called Urfa. Uh, his family moved from there, migrated, made hijra from there because of the uh, arrival of the Mongols and uh, settled instead in Damascus, where he grew up. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah's father was a scholar of Hadith. He had the title Shaykh al-Hadith, which was commonly given to the main teacher of Hadith in the schools of the time. He taught at a school called Dar al sukkariya And uh, Ibn Taymiyyah himself studied in that school. And uh, his father used to have a circle in the main masjid of Damascus where he taught hadith. So Ibn Taymiyyah grew up in this environment and he studied under the scholars who were available. He memorized the Quran uh, before he reached puberty and he studied the main sciences of Islamic law, uh, major areas of uh, Islamic sciences. And uh, he was so such an outstanding student that uh, people were amazed at his intelligence. You know, from the time he was 19 years old, he was answering questions of scholars in the masters. You know, issues which would dumbfound the scholars, which they had problems finding you know, answers for, they were put to Ibn Taymiyyah and he was answering them. And when he used to be asked to talk on any given topic, if he gave a talk on a topic, for example, he used to get into such depth into the topic that people used to think that that's his area of specialization. You know, that's where his knowledge was limited, you know. But then he had another topic to talk on and all of a sudden he is in the same kind of depth in that area. So his knowledge was quite vast. He had written in his lifetime more than 300 volumes, you know. And uh, he did not actually uh, limit himself even to the areas of Islamic law, etc. He went into areas of philosophy, looking into the problems which were Muslims were facing because of the uh, introduction 
of Greek philosophy, philosophical thought into the Muslim uh, mind and in the Muslim world. So he dealt with a lot of these kind of issues. He also went into areas of, um, of comparative religion. You know, he did a book called Al Jawab al Sahih, Fiman Baddala fi Deen al Masih, which is the correct answer for those who change the religion of the Messiah. He wrote that, you know, way back in the 13th century, you know, a major work where he tackled their issues, quoted from their books, you know, and, and debated their ideas, showing the wrongness of it. And uh, one of the things which we noted that uh, when he was going to study as a young man, on his way to his classes, a Jew from Damascus used to meet him on the way and throw questions at him, you know, trying to shake him, shake his faith and to, but it only made him stronger and he would continue coming back each time and responding to the man you know, until eventually that individual accepted Islam. Now, he, as a scholar, though he was from what would be called the Hanbali school of law, he did not restrict himself to the rulings of that school. He was attracted to the school because of the fact that the scholars of the school at that time, even though it was one of the smaller schools, because at that time, the Hanafi and Shafi schools, they were the dominant schools. Maliki was out in the, uh, basically in the West. It had been the school in, uh, in Spain, in North Africa, so it was mostly concentrated out in the West. So the Hanbali school was quite weak. It was in Iraq, but it was weak. So he adopted it mainly because of the fact that the, the Hanbali school scholars were known at that time to take their Aqidah, to take their creed from the same sources they took their fiqh. This was, this was the approach of the Hanbali scholars, they were known for that. Maybe the people called them literalists. You know, they would just take the evidences, you want to pro prove a point of Aqidah, you bring Quran, you bring Sunnah, you bring statement of the Sahaba, you know, this is where you based your creed on. Whereas the other schools, uh, by then, the uh, philosophical thought had become so deeply rooted in the various other schools that that's where they used to create their arguments for uh, the deen from. Belief in Allah and all the different things were all based on philosophical arguments. And the different issues of the creed were all argued from a philosophical, a logical perspective. So basically, he was caught in the controversy of the time, the struggle which existed between the uh, scholars of the Shafi'i school and others and that of the Hanbali school, you know, the, how to approach the deen. And he supported the Hanbali approach and promoted it, right? Now, of course, the Hanbali, what we're calling the Hanbali approach was really the approach of the early generations. That was the approach of the Sahaba. When people were, when the Sahaba were asked questions about the deen, they didn't start drawing from their reasons and philosophy to try to make explanations for people. No, they said, Allah said, the messenger said, you know, this is where they, this is where they came from. This is what they used as the basis for their explanations. Now, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah specialized in hadith. He was known to have memorized huge volumes of hadith. He read all the classical books of hadith. He read them numbers of times. And he became a reference work for people who wanted to know where to find this hadith. He would be able to tell them you can find it in you know, Sahih Bukhari. Or you can find it in you know, Sunan Ibn uh, Abi Dawood or whatever. He, he was well known for his ability to identify the sources, this is with the chains of narrators and everything. Uh, Allah, you know, blessed him with a very strong memory. And the scholars, you know, of course he had, uh, being a popular scholar, I mean, because of his uh, great knowledge, uh, he also became unpopular among those who he criticized. Right? There was a rising dislike of Ibn Taymiyyah because he was a very critical individual. You know, he wouldn't tolerate deviance, so he used to attack it, whether it was coming from the Sufis or from the Ash'aris or whatever group. 
the express deviation where the Shiites, he wrote a book on the Shiites, Minhaj Sunnah, Nabawiya, a whole you know, set of volumes in response to one of the leading Shiite scholars of his time had written a book in defense of the Shiite Madhab. So he responded to them in an you know, extensive work. Uh, so he basically, everybody who had deviated around him, he spoke out against, he wrote against. So naturally, those scholars who were in uh, big positions in the government, who were judges, etc., etc., they were irked by him. They didn't really like him at all. And uh, as a result, they made life very difficult for him. They were always going to the sultans and you know, complaining about him and spreading rumors, distorting his statements, you know, which led to his imprisonment a number of times. The last years of his last life, last 20 odd years of his life, so most of it was spent in jail, in and out of jail. You know? um, but uh, that is another story. Anyway, Ibn Taymiyyah not only was involved in the literary end of the Islamic uh, thought or Islamic practice. He was also involved in different issues concerning jihad. Where there were issues of jihad, problems existed. He was there advising, encouraging, making fatwas for, this, for the troops to be able to fight during Ramadan, breaking their fast. You know, he made a fatwa concerning that. Um, he spoke, he went in delegations to meet the leaders of the uh, uh, the invading forces, like the Tatar king, uh, Khazan, who had converted to Islam, well, his parents, or himself converted to Islam, and he was on one occasion about to enter and sack Damascus. So the people came to him, the Temi asked him, people of Damascus asked him to go and meet this man and try to discourage him from doing it. So when he went before the king, he said to him, you claim to be a Muslim. Very bold words. You claim to be a Muslim and you have with you, you have with you a Muslim judge, an imam for salah, and a sheikh, and people to call the adhan, or so I'm told. Your father and grandfather were both disbelievers, kuffar. Yet, they did not do what you have done. They both made promises and fulfilled them. While you pledged and betrayed it, you promised and didn't fulfill it. He had promised not to enter Damascus, but then later on, he decided he was going to enter it. So anyway, this had such an impact on the ruler, Kazan, that he gave his word not to enter Damascus and left. And he asked about Ibn Taymiyyah, who was he, you know? So uh, this, this was Ibn Taymiyyah. He was in a number of different occasions, you know, going to when, uh, when Damascus was again attacked later on, he went to the sultans of Egypt and the other neighboring countries, encouraging them to defend it, not to leave Damascus to the hands of the disbelievers. So, Ibn Taymiyyah was a scholar who applied his knowledge, was involved in jihad to the degree he was able to contribute, and as we said, he had become very unpopular among the scholars of his time who had or who were blindly following the schools of Islamic law and who in many cases were affected by Sufism. Sufism had become so widespread that scholars of that time commonly would name themselves, after you name yourself, you identify your name, then they would identify the, the uh, school of law. They would say, Ashafi. Then they would identify which philosophical school. They would say, you know, for example, an Ashari. And then they would add to it also what Sufi school, a Naqshabandi. So it was common for the scholars of that time to, to have these different labels at the end of their names, you know. So it was widespread. So his attack on Sufism, systematic attack on the fundamental ideas, not on the people who may be referred to as Sufis, the Sufis call them Sufis, people like Al-Hassan al-Basri, you know, Junaid, uh, Abdul Qadir al-Jilani and others, who became saints 
among the Sufis, but who were they not themselves calling people to, to worship them or call on them in their worship, you know. So he defended these people and defended, you know, people's right to be aesthetic, to live simple lives, you know, to be away from the dunya, because really the deen encouraged that. He himself lived that kind of a life. He didn't have a lot of trappings around him. He didn't marry, actually. You know, he was so busy and ending up in jail so much time, he didn't have a chance to even marry. So, he was opposed, though, to the uh, fundamental issues of Sufism, which lie in one, on one hand, uh, deification of the human soul, claiming that the human soul is a part of Allah within us. The misunderstanding that Allah blew into us a piece of himself. Right? It's a misunderstanding. And the claim that there are people who will call saints, people who are closer to Allah, who could be prayed to and through. The fact that there are people closer to Allah, we don't deny it. People are in different positions relative to Allah. Allah refers to his awliya, but he has defined who his awliya are. Those who believe in him, you know, fear him and do righteous deeds. These are the qualities of the awliya of Allah. But for the people, it meant doing, mass of the people, they meant doing miracles, you know, things which appear to people to be miracles, you know, and um, uh, prescribing different rules and principles of dhikr and this type of things. These were the things which were related to the awliya. So he spoke against their claims and their ideas, the evidences which they tried to use from the Quran and the Sunnah to support themselves, you know, uh, because of course, to convince Muslims, you had to bring some evidences, but they were of course misinterpreted, things which were misunderstood, which they uh, interpreted in such a way as to promote their own ideas. Anyway, he began uh, going back and forth to jail from the year 1306. And he ended up in the last time uh, he ended up in jail was in the year uh, 1326. And between that time he was in and out. When people tried to intervene on his part, you know, and, you know, express sorrow for what was happening to him, being the scholar he was and everything else, his response to them was to say, what can my foes do to me? My paradise, my garden are inside me. Whenever I go, wherever I go, they are with me. If they imprison me, it is the Atikaf, religious retreat. If they expel me from my homeland, it's Hijra. Again, a blessed act. If they kill me, my death will be martyrdom, inshallah. So, Allah's scriptures and His Prophet Sunnah are in my heart. You know, so this was the approach of Ibn Taymiyyah. Anyway, in the year 1326, uh, cases were raised against him where it was claimed that he prohibited people from going to the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid. In fact, he had only uh, revived the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in which he said, do not undertake journeys to other than three mosques. He revived that. He called people to reflect on this. But this prohibited the setting out uh, on journeys, religious journeys to mosques other than the Mosque of the Prophet, the Mosque of Mecca, Kaaba, and the Mosque of Jerusalem, Quds. Right? So he was saying, these are the only three you could make religious journeys to. They were claiming, he was saying, you can't make religious journey to the Prophet's mosque. Because of course they were mixing up what he said concerning mosques which have graves in it and, and claiming then, okay, since he says you shouldn't go to mosques with graves in it, it means he's saying you shouldn't go to the Prophet Sallallahu mosque. You know, so and so. Anyway, when he was in prison, he was there for two years. He still continued to teach from prison. He wrote, but after two years in prison and they saw that they could not shut him down, they couldn't stop him, 
uh, they decided to take away all his writings, take away his ink, his pens, and left him in the bare cell. At this point, there was nothing he could do. Within three months' time, he died. And his death, his funeral, is a classic example of the statement made by Ahmad ibn Hanbal in regards to those who were calling to innovation and who were putting him on trial in his own time. He had said, tell the innovators, the difference between you and us will be evident in the number of those who attend our funerals. Tell the innovators, the difference between you and us will be evident in the number of those who attend our funerals. And the numbers of people who attended the funeral of Ibn Taymiyyah were phenomenal. Uh, the scholars of the time spoke about it, you know, as something, you know, unseen before or after. Anyway, that was Ibn Taymiyyah. As I said, what is most significant regarding him is his call to the Quran and the Sunnah as it was understood by the early generation who we refer to as the Salaf. Uh, that they followed the path of the Salaf. He revived that path, called to it, promoted it. And his students like Ibn Kathir, Imam al-Zahabi and others carried on that tradition to the generations afterwards. Anyway, uh, we can now begin to look at the book itself. Actually, when Ibn Taymiyyah wrote it, it's just a continual essay. In the notes that you have, I've divided it into different chapters and sections, you know, based on the main point which he's developing in each. This is just for ease of reading and following the ideas. Anyway, the first chapter I call Purpose of the Heart. Ibn Taymiyyah, Allah Yerhamu, said, Indeed, Allah, may He on high be glorified, created the human heart in order to know things. Indeed, Allah created the human heart to know things. In the same way in which He created the eye to see things, the ear to hear things, may He be glorified. He created every part of the human body for a specific purpose and a particular function. Thus, the hand was created for grasping and holding, the foot for walking and the tongue for articulating speech, the mouth for tasting, the nose for smelling, the skin for touching, and likewise the remainder of the internal and external limbs and organs. So Ibn Taymiyyah begins uh, straight away his essay talking about the heart. Its purpose, primarily to know things within the overall framework of the body parts. That each body part has been created for a particular function. Each part has been created for a particular function. There's no part of the body which we consider to be vestigial, something left over from previous generations which we don't really need, we can do without it, has no real purpose, no. This concept is a Darwinian, the product of Darwinian thought. The fact that we uh, evolved according to Darwinian thought from the apes, earlier uh, stages we went through these things, we still carry bits and pieces of it with us. All you have to do is look at the evolution, the development of the human embryo, where it goes through different phases, where it seems to have what they call pharyngeal pouches, it looks like gills. And it seems to have a tail. It even looks like a little fish at the point. You know, all these different things. They say, huh, this is evidence that human beings pass through these different phases. And of course, scholars, you know, who know, you know point out that this, the similarity in structure doesn't indicate similarity in purpose. Right? Or any relationship. Because if we are to take similarity in structure as a relationship, you have the rhinoceros, a mammal, found in Africa and India. Do they have rhinoceroses in India? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The rhinoceros is known. You also have a beetle in 
uh, in Malaysia called the rhinoceros beetle because it has horns on its what is the head it looks like the head area it's really the back yeah it has horns there it looks like horns so it looks something like the horns of the rhinoceros so they call it the rhinoceros beetle but no one no scientist in his right mind would claim that there's any relationship between the rhinoceros beetle and the mammal known as the rhinoceros so this kind of argument is fallacious it has no basis really in in the real world we have many many structures which look similar from animal to animal and they have different purposes altogether anyway uh, we also know that there are a number of organs in the body or elements in the cells which <coughs> scholars scientists of the past said don't seem to have any function among them the mitochondria I remember when I went to high school uh, and studied the mitochondria it is way back in the 60s the scholars were saying these things don't seem to have any function at all we had to learn it was a part of the function of the cell but mainly the nucleus was the main thing they talked about you know the RNA the DNA and then there was the mitochondria stuck around different parts of the cell but what its purpose was nobody seemed to know said so it's, maybe it's some vestigial thing that has been left over for when the cell was evolving now they come to realize that mitochondria has a primary role in the formation of RNA and you know all kinds of information also mitochondria has a big importance then it seemed to have been nothing something useless you know similarly with the appendix people talk about the appendix you know that uh, it's, it's something just harmful we don't see any benefit we can't figure out any benefit from it they say it's probably left over from the earlier generations when human beings ate a lot of poisonous type foods and there's a way in which the body used to store the poisons this was the appendix you know because of course if your appendix uh, explodes or breaks inside of you right bursts inside of you you many times people die of course if you're near to a hospital they can treat you but if you're not people in third world countries etc they die from it so it became the standard practice from way back in the 60s you know that people when they were doctors if a doctor had to go into you for any reason he had to open up your stomach or near your stomach for any reason he would just automatically reach down and cut off your appendix Halas, throw that along with it you know doing you a favor as they thought right but you know from the islamic perspective we reject this idea as allah said afa hasibtum annama khalaqnakum abatha wa annakum ilayna la turja'un this is surah al-mu'minun 23rd chapter verse 115 where allah says do you think you were created without purpose and that you should not have to return to me whatever allah created has a purpose it's a general principle you know i mean even people sometimes say well what about the fly what is the purpose of a fly you know beyond annoying and being nasty you know we know the fly is annoying and nasty we try to kill everyone we can catch right but the reality is the scientists will tell you that if it were not for the flies to break down animal matter we would be up to our eyes in carcasses that did not decay the fly finds the carcass lays its eggs in it the maggots come and they eat it up and it's a means of disposing so much animal matter if we didn't have the fly who would be in serious problems so the fly has a major role but of course in the past people couldn't see what is the role of the fly you know and even today the average person we ask him what's the importance of a fly you know, he said, there's nothing, there's nothing, what's a fly? We could live better lives without flies. Actually, we couldn't, right? So even something so insignificant, you know, which Allah uses as the example of the weakness of human beings, that if the, all of the human beings got together, including the jinn, etc., they wouldn't be able to even make the wing of a fly. Not even the wing, not just a fly, just the wing they couldn't make to show the weakness of human beings we'll not be able to create anyway the point is that Ibn Taymiyyah introduces the heart from the perspective of its primary purpose in terms of its function that it functions as 
the organ by which we know things. Right? And of course, we're going to look into it in more detail. Uh, know things in what sense. Anyway, he goes on to say, because he, he compared it to all of the other organs, for us just to put it in that general perspective. It has a function similar to the functions of the others. Meaning that each organ has a role, a purpose to be fulfilled. And whether we use that organ as it should be used or we don't, is going to determine our relationship with Allah. Because everything we have is a blessing from Allah. All of these limbs that he spoke about, the tongue, the no nose, the mouth, the ear, you know, the skin, all of these different uh, senses and sense organs, etc. that we have, these are all blessings from Allah that Allah has given us, that we are responsible for, which we must use in a way which is pleasing to Allah. So Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, if a person uses a limb, according to the way it was created to be used and for the purpose for which it was designed that is the clear truth and justice on the basis of which the heavens and the earth were set up when the limbs of the body are used for the purpose for which they were designed because of course when Allah created them he designed that they be used for particular purposes we said the hand is designed to be used to grab things the foot to walk uh, the ear to hear the eye to see that is the main function but is that function a neutral function meaning no matter what you grab you're using it for its purpose. No matter what you see, you're using it the eye for its purpose. No matter what you hear, no matter where you walk. No. Yes, these organs are themselves neutral. They're, the organs themselves are actually neutral. However, the way you use it will determine whether you're using it according to what it was designed because of course if Allah created us with these limbs it must be for these limbs to be used in a righteous way that is what they were designed for to be used in righteousness because Allah is righteous he's good and he loves righteousness and he has called the deen is a deen of righteousness so therefore the hand was designed to be used to grasp things which were pleasing to Allah the ear to hear things which are pleasing to Allah, the eye to see what is pleasing to Allah, the feet to walk to what is pleasing to Allah. So when we use the limbs in a way which is pleasing to Allah, then we are now using them for the purpose for which they were designed. Physical function to grasp, but grasp what? Grasp what is pleasing to Allah. So we have to combine the two. We talk about fulfilling the function of the limb, right? And he refers to that as being the clear truth and justice on which the heavens and earth were set up. Allah created the heavens and earth in truth, haq, and justice, adl. This is how he created the heavens and the earth. Meaning that all of the things in the heaven and the earth they function according to his will. Right? Whether it's the clouds, whether it's the stars, whether it's volcanoes, whether it's the seas, whatever, in the heavens and the earth, function according to the will of Allah. And Allah mentions about creation that all, the, all that is in the heavens and the earth praise Allah. But you cannot understand their praise. And it's in Surah Al-Isra. Uh, Allah talks about that. that. They all. So if they're all praising Allah, that is their purpose, to praise Allah. So they are fulfilling their purpose. So therefore, in the fulfillment of their purpose, there is truth. And on the basis of that truth, there is justice. Right? And when he talked about the heavens and the earth being set up in truth and justice, actually he's referring to a number of verses found throughout the Quran where Allah says, in fact, وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ بِالْحَقِّ 
It is he who created the heavens and the earth in truth. So, Ibn Taymiyyah links that truth, a general state that the heavens and the earth were created doing truly what Allah has prescribed. Truth being the foundation of justice because you cannot have justice without truth. True justice. False justice, yes. You can have false justice without truth. What is the truth? The truth is what Allah has defined as the truth. Meaning, one could say, it is just that if a man can have four wives, a woman can also have four wives, husbands. That's just. That's fair. Because what we mean when we say just here, we say that means fair. But on what truth is that based? It's not according to the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah, He has made it permissible for men and not for women. So though there may appear to be fairness and as a consequence, justice, it's not based on truth. It's based on human reason. What seems reasonable to the human being. And that, in many cases, is not the truth. The truth which Allah has prescribed is one based on human realities, knowledge of the human being, of males and how they are made up because He created them, of females and how they are made up because He created them, and, and what was needed for them to function effectively in the society together. So Allah prescribed that. He is the one who knew before He created them that most crimes would be committed by men. And most violent crimes which involve taking the lives of other human beings would be done by men. And wars would be men killing men. And so on and so forth. That men would live shorter lives than women. Because he designed them in that way. That there would be a surplus of women in most societies. If nature is allowed to take its course, the nature or the, the natural way in which Allah has created things. So when he prescribed, he prescribed things according to the realities of the human being which with uh, in, in how he created them. Ibn Taymiyyah then goes on to say, furthermore, that is better and beneficial for the limb and its owner, as well as for the function for which it was used, right? Naturally, when the limb is used in the way it was prescribed, it is better. It is better. Not only for the limb, but for the owner of the limb. For example, if we get a screwdriver, right? This screwdriver is a big size, so it's made for big screws. But you use it for a small screw, right? So you have to jam it in there, you have to bash it, etc., and then you turn it. It's not good for the screwdriver. And in the end, it's not beneficial for you because you're going to damage that screw. Later on, when you come, you want to take the screw out. <laughs> you've, you've jammed it in there in such a way you can't take it out. So it's, it's harmful to you in the end, as well as it's harmful to your screwdriver. So when instruments are used for the purpose for which they're created, then it's better for the instrument itself, as well as the owner of the instrument. <laughs> Now, Ibn Taymiyyah then goes on to say, such a person who uses his limbs or her limbs according to the purpose for which they were created, such a person is truly righteous. This is the essence of righteousness. Essence of righteousness being to use one's faculties in a way which is pleasing to Allah. That is the essence of righteousness. So he said, such a person is truly righteous, whose state of being is upright. And such people are following guidance from their Lord, and it is they who will be successful. 
he in uh, describing them he paraphrases a verse from Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah says there those are following guidance from their Lord and they are those who are successful ulaika ala hudam mir rabbihim wa ulaika humul muflihun right and this is his style as he is explaining things he will slide into a part of a quranic verse or a part of a hadith and that's how he wrote you know and this is how scholars also will speak uh, when you hear them giving lectures etc they may not say it was narrated by abu huraira that the prophet sallallahu alaihi said so and so and so, and so. or in surah this verse that you know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said so and so no they may just uh, paraphrase and, and and insert a verse or a hadith or a statement of the sahaba or whatever in the course of their talk those listening to them of course they know because they have memorized that verse or they heard the hadith they know exactly where it's coming from so this is why of course for our purposes whenever these things are done they we will look at uh, the sources of where it came from anyway a person who is following this truth who is using his or her limbs in the way that they were designed to be used such a person must be following guidance because without guidance you're not going to arrive there yes we are created with a nature a natural belief in allah etc but the environment around us draws us into all kinds of things this is the reality the environment has this powerful impact on us which causes us to become everything but what we were created to be so for a person to then use his or her limbs as they were prescribed by Allah to be used they must have guidance this is why Allah sent prophets with books of guidance to guide human kind that's why the very first human being who was on the face of the earth was a prophet of Allah because if he wasn't a prophet of Allah you know he had to deal with his circumstance he was the authority he was the one important then without that guidance from Allah then he is likely to make major mistakes and misguide others so that's why the very first person was not only the first person but a prophet of Allah Allah sent guidance to the prophets and their books etc then ibn taymiyyah goes on to describe the other states of limbs and faculties and senses you either use it for what it was used per, you know proposed to be used for what Allah set its purpose as or you don't or in the middle you don't use it at all you just leave it as a useless limb a useless faculty you don't benefit from it it's just wasted so he said if the limb is not used in the proper way and instead is left unused that is a loss a real loss and the owner is cheated its owner is cheated the limb is not used in the proper way it's just left unused that is a loss because it means either we're gaining or we're losing that's the reality either we are benefiting or we're being harmed now in not using a limb we might not see obvious harm we say so what we didn't use this limb where is the harm well the harm is that the opportunity that we had to take benefit from that limb was lost so who is the loser we we who didn't use the limb in the way it should have been used we have lost and he goes on to say such a person is cheated actually the term he used there is maghbun and this term maghbun is commonly used in business in arabic it was classically used in big business to refer to a person being cheated in their business now that term was used by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a well known hadith the hadith concerning spare time and good health prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had said in a hadith narrated by ibn abbas 
نعمتان مغبون فيهما كثير من الناس الصحة والفراغ There are two blessings about which many people are cheated health and spare time health and spare time meaning that a person thinks that they have good health and that this will last forever so they don't take benefit from that health when they had the chance similarly they think they have spare time time to kill time to waste and of course that time is not always there the time is gone then they look as oh i wish i had used that time to do so and so they they have lost they have been fooled by satan and such they were cheated some of the some of the comments that some of the scholars said concerning this hadith uh, ibn battal he said the meaning of the hadith is that a person is not free until he has whatever is sufficient for himself and his physical health is good whoever finds that should be careful that he is not deceived by abandoning giving thanks to allah for the blessings he has bestowed on him among the expressions of gratitude to him is strictly following his commands and avoiding his prohibitions whoever fails to do so is deceived and he indicated by the phrase many people that those who are blessed not to be deceived are few ibn al-jawzi he also said concerning the same hadith a person may be healthy but not free due to being busy with earning a living or he could be without need for earning a living and not be healthy if the two factors good health spare time come together and laziness from acts of obedience overcomes him he is deceived if a person is negligent in his responsibilities due to laziness in times of good health and free time then he has been deceived the full picture is that this world is the farm of the next world in it is business whose profits will appear in the next life so whoever uses his free time and health in doing acts of obedience is in an enviable position fortunate and blessed and whoever uses them in acts of disobedience is deceived because free time is followed by busy time and health is followed by sickness even if it is only old age at-tibi he commented saying the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made a parable of a trader whose capital who has capital and seeks to profit along with the safety of his capital his way to achieve that is to be careful about whom he deals with to adhere to the truth and to be a skillful trader in order not to be deceived or cheated <laughs> good health and free time is capital he should deal with allah with iman fight his desires and the enemy of religion in order to profit from the best of this world and the next what is close to it to this description is what allah mentioned in the quran in surah saf verse 10 hal adullukum ala tijaratin tunjikum min adhabin alim shall i show you a trade which will save you from the severe punishment what is required of him atib goes on to say is that he avoid disobedience he avoids obedience to his soul's desires and dealings with shaitan in order not to lose his capital along with his profits in his statement prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said many people are deceived regarding them it is similar to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to allah's statement in the quran 
Surah Sabah, Sabah, verse 13, وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ Few of my servants are thankful. Many in the hadith is equivalent to few in the verse. So, the general advice stated by Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi is that <coughs> Iman, which is the greatest blessing that a human being can receive, should be protected. And that whoever lets ra his, the reins loose to his evil commanding soul, which eternally desires displeasure and um, abandons adherence to divinely, lim the divinely set limits, and constancy in doing acts of obedience has been deceived. Whoever leaves that is deceived. Similar is the case if he is not busy. If he's not busy in doing righteous deeds, looking after his soul, then he has been deceived. Now, the third category we mentioned, or Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, concerning the use of the limbs, is where it is used in conflict with what Allah created it for. If it is used in contradiction to what it was created for, that is misguidance and destruction, and its owner is among those who change the blessings of Allah with disbelief. What he has done here is he has quoted a verse uh, indirectly where Allah said, Alam tara ila ladina baddalu ni'mat Allahi kufra. Have you not seen those who exchange the blessings of Allah for disbelief? Because these limbs were all blessings of Allah. If they're not used to please Allah, in fact they're used in displeasure of Allah, then this is replacing blessings with kufr. Because using Allah's blessings in conflict to Allah's commands is a form of kufr. It doesn't mean a person who does this becomes a disbeliever. But it is a form of disbelief, right? Because had we believed in Allah properly as He should be believed in, then there's no way we can use His limbs against His command. Use the limbs which He has created for us against His commands. Um, Ibn Taymiyyah, when he said that using the limbs for other than, the, than what it was created for means here that the limbs are used in disobedience of Allah. Using the limbs to do sinful acts is a misuse of the limbs that results from the misunderstanding of its purpose and from misguidance which will ultimately lead to one's destruction. So, the use of the limbs and faculties can be divided into three categories. Using it for its purpose, that is for the pleasure of Allah. Not using it, leaving it. That is personal loss and deception by Satan. And thirdly, using it against the command of Allah. And that is of course sin, evil. And involved in it also is deception. We have been deceived. Then Ibn Taymiyyah makes a general statement concerning the heart itself. He said, the master of all limbs and their head is the heart. As it has been named, Qalb, heart. The master of all limbs and their head is the heart. He makes a linguistic mention here, that that's why it's called Qalb. Now Ibn Hajar in Fath al-Bari, he said that it, the heart is called Qalb because it is the essence of the body and contains the essence of everything. Anything which contains the essence is referred to as Qalb in Arabic. It's an Arabic term which means the essence. And we in English, we use it also, we say 
the heart of the matter. Can you get to the heart of the matter? You know, meaning what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't have a heart, really. It means the essence, a core, right? So this is what he he alludes to the linguistic meaning. Of course, the word qalb is also explained by scholars to mean or to take its meaning from its flippant nature, that it flips back and forth. You know, qalb also means something turned upside down. Right? So, uh, as the Prophet ﷺ had said, that the heart is between the fingers of the Most Merciful, Allah. He flips them as he wishes. And he would make dua saying, you know, Ya muqallib al thabbit qalbi ala dinik. O flipper of hearts, make my heart firm on your religion. So, this is another meaning, but Ibn Taymiyyah focuses on the meaning which implies the essence of things, the core. And that is the role of the heart within the body. Okay, this is as far as we will go. Uh, today, inshallah, we'll continue to look at the purpose of the heart, still in chapter, uh, first chapter. And we'll be looking at the well-known hadith concerning halal and haram. Wherein the Prophet ﷺ closed that hadith saying, Indeed in the body there is a clump of flesh. If it becomes good, the whole body becomes good. And if it goes bad, the whole body goes bad. Indeed, it is the heart. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, ashadu wa la ilaha al-hant, astaghfiruka. In our previous session, we began to look at the chapter on the function of the heart. We spoke about the Imtaymiyyah addressed the heart within the context of the other uh, body parts. That the body parts and organs, how they function, uh, the heart functions in a similar way as the effort of the eye is called seeing, the effort of the heart is referred to as reflection and thought, and he discussed that point. And they basically use that uh, to develop the idea that our understanding, just as our sight, our ability to grasp things, our ability to walk, etc., all of these abilities are blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As he pointed out, there are many occasions when people strive to see things and they're not able to see it. And then there are occasions when people don't strive to see something and they see it. You know, so obviously this issue of being able to fulfill the goal of a given uh, organ or limb of the body, this is among the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Ibn Taymiyyah uh, went on to point out that the heart was created not just to know things, but to understand them, knowing meaning, acquiring knowledge. The heart does function in that way. Knowledge is naturally absorbed by it. But its purpose was not that, but to understand the knowledge that it acquires. And then he discussed the issues of uh, the importance of that understanding, uh, wherein he pointed out that people might know certain things, but 
not act on it. In fact, they may even reject it. And we gave the examples of Abu Talib, for example, who had knowledge. He had knowledge of the prophethood of Muhammad wasallam, but he rejected him in the sense that when he was called to uh, make shahada before his death, he didn't respond. So here is a case of knowledge, but that knowledge was not transformed into true understanding, which is manifest in action. Then he went on to discuss the issue that the understanding was either a favor which Allah had blessed one with or it was a talent which one may acquire. And that's basically where we had stopped. He now goes on to discuss further the implications of understanding, true understanding, that which the heart is supposed to function in accordance with. He said, the one who understands something is one who is able to specify its limitations, accurately define it, be conscious of it, and confirm it in his heart. In times of need, it is sufficient for him, and his actions match his statements. His internal state is the same as his external. That is the one who has granted wisdom, and whoever has been given wisdom has been given a great good. The one who understands something is one who is able to define or to specify its limitations. Meaning that understanding includes not merely the facts, but the implications of the facts. We should have a grasp of the implications. If one doesn't have a grasp of the implications, then we're only absorbing bits and pieces of knowledge. But these knowledge, these bits and pieces of knowledge all have implications. They imply that something may be acceptable or may not be acceptable. For example, uh, we have the statement of the Prophet ﷺ that whatever <coughs> intoxicates in large amounts is forbidden in small amounts. Right? Now that is a piece of knowledge. Whatever intoxicates in large amounts is forbidden in small amounts. Now, one may conclude from that that if you found a substance, a drink or food which has 0.001% of alcohol, that it is haram for you to eat that food. Right? Or it may mean that for you to take or consume a small amount of intoxicants is just as haram as to consume a large amount. Meaning, you have a drink which is an intoxicating drink which you know, but you will only take a teaspoon or a shy glass. So we say the ruling, whether you drink a full glass or a shy glass, this is haram. However, a substance which has in it a small portion of intoxicant, meaning this is a chemical analysis. Scientists, chemists analyze this food and tell you there is 0.001 alcohol in this food. Is this haram or not? 
Well, the truth of the matter is that that which has 0.001% is not haram. It's not haram. Because that same food, no matter how much you ate of it, it would never intoxicate you. If we are to use, this is where some people have gone overboard in chemical analyses. If we are to use that criteria, then any able chemist will tell you that yes, in Coca-Cola, in yogurt, in a variety of foods, you can find 0.001% alcohol. Because all you have to do is produce the OH molecule and you have a element of alcohol. So this is not what was intended. When the Prophet Muhammad said, what intoxicates in large amounts is forbidden in small amounts, it doesn't mean that that small amount which may show up in something else makes that whole thing forbidden. Can we understand the distinction between the two? So, when we're talking about understanding, it means that in-depth understanding which is able to define what is, what is intended by the text. And of course, that comes from wider knowledge. Because this is a big fitna actually, people not understanding this distinction, especially for those of us that live in the West, where we have to deal with issues of rennet and cheese, right? Rennet and cheese. Rennet, which is commonly taken from the belly of the pig, an enzyme, which is added, for example, to milk, to curdle it, so they can go ahead and make cheese. So, once people found out that that rennet source is from the pig, then all cheese became haram. We, nobody could eat cheese anymore in America who was Muslim. If you consider yourself a practicing Muslim, then khalas, no more cheese. Because you could, unless you could find cheese produced by the Jews, right, which was free from any uh, <coughs> animal sources other than what they slaughtered themselves. But the reality, Prophet Muhammad said that if water reaches the level of kullatain, a large amount of water, the scholars couldn't define exactly what kullatain was. I said it was, you know, so many gallons and so many, a large amount of water that it will not become najis if amounts of najasa goes in it. Meaning, you're in a, at the uh, lake and somebody on the far side of the lake, you see them urinating in the lake. As does that lake now become najis? You cannot make wudu from the water of the lake? No. They're doing that, it's not going to affect all of that water. It's not going to affect it. Though personally, you may feel, well, I don't want to make wudu from that anymore. That's your personal choice. It's no harm. You're not obliged. Although, if it becomes either make wudu or make tayammum, now you're obliged. Because you're not allowed to make tayammum because you wouldn't like to make wudu from that water. If the water is in fact najis, you are justified in making tayammum. Okay. It's an important point. So if we understood that, then we come back to the rennet, which is an extremely minute amount. You're talking about an amount which is hardly even visible, which they put into a vat, a huge vat of milk. And it is an enzyme, meaning it is a catalyst. It functions in it, causes this thing to happen. They pull it out and they leave it behind. But the fact that they use that enzyme the Muslims went, oh, haram. But the fact of the matter is that that little amount of enzyme in that huge amount of milk, not counted. Now, if we come to Muslims and say, can you produce that? This is another story. This is where foods come to us 
and we can judge can we eat it or not can we drink this or not but now if you for example were to make cake and put in 0 0.001 alcohol in it for the taste this is forbidden because it means you have to purchase alcohol or produce it and that is haram make the distinction if the cake came to us it's been made kuffar made it non-muslims made it and sent it to us now that amount is not enough to intoxicate you that food is ed edible can we see the difference between the two you cannot produce it because it means producing alcohol or purchasing alcohol which we're not allowed to do but if a substance or given food or whatever has minute amounts of najasa in it that does not invalidate that substance for consumption this is a basic principle actually Sheikh Masuddin Albani had done some extensive uh, lectures on this topic anyway understanding is knowing its limitations to be able to accurately define it to be conscious of it and confirm it in the heart confirm it in the heart meaning it is accepted as a part of faith it's confirmed in the heart as a part of faith and this is the understanding which Prophet Sallallahu meant in the well-known hadith where he said May yuridillahu bihi khayran yufaqihu fi deen Whoever Allah wishes good, for whoever Allah wishes good, He gives him the understanding of the religion. He gives him the understanding of the religion. Because you may have uh, an Orientalist who has understanding, but it's not in the heart. It's not been accepted in the heart. He has the knowledge of it and he can give you explanations and even define for you some of its limits. But the issue of the heart becomes critical. Accepting it in the heart now distinguishes between the believer and the non-believer. The person who has true understanding and the person who has academic uh, qualifications or grasp. Also, you have people who uh, amongst us Muslims, scholars, who may know the technical information about a particular ruling and they have, they're able to make all these explanations about it, but they're doing it for notoriety, to be known, to be popular, to be famous, etc. Again, the heart has not truly accepted it. So such a person would, even though they have, they know all, have all the information, they're able to define the limits, give you explanations for it. But when the time comes to actually do it, you might find them not doing it. You wonder how is that? Because it had not been accepted in the heart. So this issue of understanding is linked to the heart. That's what he's stressing here. What happens, that's why it goes on to further add, in times of need, it is sufficient for him. In times of need, it is sufficient for him. He doesn't seek to escape the implications of that knowledge. He knows in his heart that knowledge says this and it means this. Now it could mean some other things which he knows it doesn't. But the person who has not truly accepted in his heart, when the time comes, time of need comes, then he will leave that understanding which he knows it actually means and goes to other possible understandings which he knows it doesn't mean. And there are also understandings. But he knows in his heart it doesn't really mean that. But the need of the circumstance, he will go with that understanding. Right? So he, his knowledge is not really following his heart. No. And this is why Prophet, uh, Allah said in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 36, 
ma kana li mu'minin wa la mu'minatin idha qada Allah wa rasuluhu amra an yakuna lahum al khiyaratu min amrihim it is not befitting for a believing man or woman to have a choice if Allah and his messenger have decided a matter there is no choice when the circumstance gets tough we don't have any choices we stick with it it is sufficient for us regardless we know that ultimately no matter how difficult things may come may appear or may become we will not change our position from that basic understanding which our hearts have accepted and this is why also Allah adds as a guideline and a reminder to us وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ Allah will provide an escape for whoever fears Allah and He will provide sustenance for him from where he did not expect it. That if you stick with what is right and this is what fearing Allah here means that you fear Allah, you know Allah knows what's in your heart, you know Allah knows, the, you know the correct understanding. You stick with that, no matter how difficult it comes, Allah will ultimately open a way for you. He will ultimately open a way. And this is one of the fitness that many of us are faced with, especially in the West, where we know well, riba is forbidden taking, paying, witnessing, etc. Riba, interest is forbidden. But when it comes to getting a house, you know, and people have been convinced, become convinced that they must have a house, right? This is the time of need. And that knowledge is no longer sufficient for them, right? They go what they call shop, uh, fatwa shopping. And this is the time that the person becomes a fatwa shopper. He starts asking all the sheikhs, he calls this one up, everyone comes into this city, you'll see him. And no matter what subject the, the, the sheikh gives a talk on, first question, is riba haram? You know, he'll be he'll always there and every time the sheikh will tell him, no, no, it's haram, not allowed, you know, forbidden, etc. Until one sheikh comes and says, sometimes, in need, it may be permissible. Ah, Alhamdulillah, that's what he was waiting for. He was waiting for that. He wasn't seeking the truth. He was looking for an escape, which would now permit him to do what was in his heart. He knew. He was just waiting for somebody to say, well, Sheikh so-and-so said it. So this is, the, this is the thing of the heart. Again, back to our hearts. Hearts, where we know something to be wrong. The true understanding is when we stick with that. What our hearts know, what our hearts tell us, we stick with it no matter what. Believing that ultimately Allah will find a way. This is another thing that happens to a lot of people with their jobs. They're on the job and maybe out of ignorance they didn't really realize that this job was not permissible. They're working in a bank. Right? Finally, somebody comes, gives a lecture or whatever, and they hear it clear, it's right up in their face. Working in the bank is haram. What to do now? It's clear. They suspected it. They didn't ask, but it came. They have the knowledge, what to do now? So they say, well, okay, inshallah, as soon as I find another job, I will leave this job. I'll make that sincere intention. As soon as I find another job, I will leave this job. And of course, months go by, years go by, they never find another job. So they ended up staying with the job anyway. You know? So the point is that once we know this thing is haram, then we have to leave it then and there. But what happens is fear. Right? 
And as Allah says, mentioned in the Quran, that shaitan will scare you with what? Faqr, poverty. If I leave the job, who's going to look after my family and my husband? What am I going to do? Well, who was looking after you actually before that? It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we lose sight of that. It's just the fear of, of poverty. So what we will do, we'll hang in there and say, until we find. And we may look, truly. Maybe in the first month, we're looking real hard. Second month, slowing down. Third month, you know, it's fourth month. Then eventually, we're not looking anymore. It's just something, whenever people say, we'll say, if we find something else, can you find something for me? You know, if you hear of anything, it's just even the effort is gone now. The point is, once we know, we leave it. We leave it. We can see this in some things which are clear. Because somebody would say, but you know, gradually, because you know, we don't want to destroy our families and this kind of things, but think about it this way. If you were drinking alcohol, and somehow you didn't know it was haram, and somebody tells you it's haram. Do you think it's acceptable to say, when I get some alternative, I will stop drinking gradually, eventually, you know? You're expected to give it up immediately. Once the haram has been defined, then there is no excuse for us. But what has happened is that Riba, interest, has been reduced. Its evil has been reduced in our minds. It's become so commonplace. It's become so commonplace that the evil of it is no longer clear to us. You know, our hearts have become numb to it. Everywhere we turn, it's there, so we kind of take it for granted. This is what has happened. We forget that the Prophet ﷺ had equated the simplest form of riba to having sexual relations with one's mother. It's mean, something abhorrent, completely abhorrent. It is that evil that the Prophet ﷺ would make that equation. But to us today, it's not looked at as being so bad. It's not as bad as drinking alcohol. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't equate alcohol as he equated riba. It means that riba, interest, must be far, the evil of it is far, you know, greater. It is far, it's far reaching. Because when something's evil is far reaching, then the punishment or then the, 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 uh, the evilness of it becomes greater and the Prophet ﷺ describes it in greater and greater terms. The less things which are confined to ourselves, then the punishment may be immediate. You get lashes, you get so and so. But when the when the implications because riba, the the the, the effects of interest on society is far reaching. Alcohol is just yourself initially, right? or somebody immediately around you. The effects are not as great as interest. Anyway. That understanding, as Ibn Taymiyyah points out, is sufficient. And his actions match his statements. <coughs> that is the sufficiency. What he says, he does. He stays with it. <coughs> and actions which contradict statements is a sign of little or no faith. It is among the attributes which Allah hates. Allah says in Surah Saf, verse 3, That you say what you do not do is greatly hated by Allah. <coughs> He also said, Afala ta'qilun. 
Do you command people to righteousness and forget yourselves? Though you read the book, وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابَ فَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Though you read the book, will you not reflect? This is an evil state. And this is the meaning of a common statement that we say in the West, that actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. We can say things, but if we don't do it, then our actions will speak much louder than our words. And this is very important when we come to the issue of raising children. When we come to the issue of raising children. Sometimes we find our children lying and we're upset. We tell them, don't lie. We spank them for lying. We deprive them of certain things they want because they lied and we stress to them, do not lie, do not lie. I'm very strong in it. But yet, we find the children, in spite of all of that, lying through the teeth when they're caught and whatever, they're lying and lying and we wonder, where is this coming from? You know, we've told them so many times not to lie, we've spanked them and done all these things for it. But nobody stopped to look at what we are actually doing in the home. When somebody calls the house and you don't want to speak to them, right? you tell the child to say, my father isn't home. Huh? You've told them to say, he's not home, he's busy. Whatever, you, something, you're telling the kids to tell them, and this is going straight into the child's head. You've told them don't lie, and now you're telling them to lie. So that statement that you've told them just canceled all those don't lies. Finish. They're going to learn directly from you and you'll find them lying because you're lying when it's convenient. Huh? You have taught them to lie by your actions while telling them not to lie by your statements. So what is going to have the greatest impact on them? You're lying. So uh, this is the same situation, you know, where uh, when initially smoking, you know, has been prohibited and banned in different places. And some of the people who used to be the loudest proponents of not to smoke were doctors, right? Who were telling people, don't smoke, it's bad for your health, blah, blah, blah. But he's got a cigarette in his hand whilst he's telling you. And you shouldn't smoke, you know, it's really, he's explaining all this, showing you diagrams, pictures on the wall, and, you know, <laughs> what is the use of all of that? And his actions, you know, he's saying, hey, surely, if it's so bad, why haven't you quit? You know? So the actions, in the end, nullify statements. That's why, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah points out that the actions should match the statements. This is one of the signs that we have internalized a uh, instruction or internalized an understanding. And <clears throat> when we look at knowledge where it is not applied, this is usually a product of the academic pursuit of knowledge. Where it doesn't increase taqwa, iman, or good character. We may know all of the pillars of salah, all of the sunnas of salah. And I remember actually teaching in school uh, in Riyadh, where some of the kids who knew well these pillars and could rattle them off for you, they weren't praying. I'd seen kids not praying in school, dodging Salah. When the time for Salah came, they would go and hide. But if you stop them and you ask them, what are the shurut? What are the conditions? What are the the, the wajibat, what are the obligatory, what are the sunnahs? They could give it right, the good exams and they passed with it. But the knowledge isn't acted upon. 
movement means it hasn't been internalized. It hasn't entered into the heart. And this is why the statement of uh, Abu Sufyan's mother, no, not, uh, Sufyan authority's mother, one of the scholars who was a contemporary of Abu Hanifa, Sufyan authority. He said that when he first set off seeking knowledge, his mother said to him, Sonny, my young son, if you learn 10 words and your Iman has not been increased, check yourself. If you learn 10 words and your Iman has not increased, then you need to check yourself. Meaning you need to check your intentions. Why are you there? What are you doing this for? This is when he was a young teenager setting out in search of knowledge. This was her advice to him. He remembered that and he would tell his own students this. <coughs> this goes back to sincerity in seeking knowledge. Sincerity in absorbing, understanding, teaching, all of this with regards to knowledge. Then Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say that his internal state is the same as his external state. His internal is the same as his external. And this is an extraction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command وَذَرُوا ظَاهِرَ الْإِثْمِ وَبَاطِنَةً Leave the internal aspects of sin as well as its or leave the external aspects of sin as well as its internal aspects. That the sin, the sin, sin should be left not only externally when people might see us etc. But it has to be left internally. Prophet Muhammad speaking about this had said, talking about Hijra, Al Muhajir Man Hajara Ma Nahallahu An. That the true immigrant, the true person making Hijra, is the one who makes Hijra from what Allah has forbidden. That is, in the heart, they have given it up. The Hijra without physically moving from one place to another, the Hijra begins in the heart. That one leaves what has been forbidden in the heart and externally one can do so consistently. But if one only leaves externally, then the time will come when nobody knows, when nobody can see, or whatever. We find ourselves in a comfortable situation and we're doing what we know we shouldn't do. You find people may give up certain things because it is no longer fashionable. They'll give up certain things because it's no longer fashionable. So, for example, we know that wearing garments below the ankle has been forbidden by the Prophet right? He said, what is below the ankle is in the hellfire. Now, people normally will wear garments, because if you're wearing western clothes especially, and this has affected also Arabs now wearing thobes, that they will extend the thobe till it's dragging on the ground, you know, down, etc. When this was the description of the garments for women, when the women questioned the Prophet ﷺ about raising the garment, he said, no, for you all, you let it down below your ankle. So this form of dress is actually a female form of dress, but it has become the common dress now from the West. Garments hanging down below the ankles. And people, of course, have a variety of rationales for it saying, you know, it's not our intention, we're not doing it out of pride and, you know, a variety of different arguments, etc. to kind of to justify it. But once the fashion changes, once the fashion changes, right, and it's changing, once it changes, then you'll find 
everybody wearing it above their ankle. No problem. The day that somebody wears their clothes amongst the, above the ankle and it becomes the fashion standard, then you see all the men changing to that. Because it's no longer fashionable to wear it below the ankle. Right? So that person who gives up wearing it below the ankle because it's no longer fashionable, he has abandoned an external aspect of sin. But internally, whenever the fashion comes back, he'll be back there again. So that abandonment for convenience, for because it's maybe embarrassing, you know, whatever, you know, people can abandon external sin for a variety of reasons. No end of reasons. But that is not true understanding. The true understanding which is in the heart causes the individual to, in, to abandon sin not only externally but also internally. That really that external practice of sin is not truly abandoned until it becomes displeasurable in the heart. <clears throat> Because if we have abandoned a sin externally, but in our heart we still have pleasure for it, we still have a desire for it. Whenever we think about it, we get a nice feeling. Even though we stopped it, but whenever we think about it, we still get a nice feeling from it. Right? Then it means we have not abandoned it. We haven't abandoned it. Truly. Maybe in the beginning, that's it's what happens. You may abandon something externally, but internally it's still there. So you have means that you have to work on it. When he's identifying these principles, he's really identifying the areas of the heart that we have to work on. To make the heart have true understanding, we have to work on the internal aspects of sin. And this is what he is implying. This is what he's addressing, you know that we have to make statements and actions consistent. What we say, we do. I mean, this is also working on the heart to ensure that this is a consistent practice uh, on our part. Sheikh Asadi, he had said in his tafsir concerning the same verse, to abandon the external as well as internal aspects of sin. He said, these include things related to Allah's rights and his slaves rights. The slaves abandonment of sin will not be complete until the slave knows what these sins are. To abandon the sins of the heart, the internal aspects of sin, one must know what the sins are. If we don't know what they are, then we cannot abandon it. So researching this issue, Sheikh Asadi goes on to say, and getting knowledge on the sins of the heart and body is an obligation. It is an obligation. Is this for here? Which one is? Actually, the speaker here, you know, actually the speaker for inside, it doesn't need to be on, I'm sure. You know, you're hearing me quite clearly. It should just be turned off. This speaker inside here, because this is creating most of the feedback. You know which one is the internal? Okay. Both places. Yep. Yeah. So this, there is a connection here. One is for local and ones. Anyway, we try to deal with that um, afterwards. <coughs> so Sheikh Asadi was uh, pointed out that it is necessary to research the sins of the heart, to be able to deal with the internal aspects of sin. He said, for many people are unaware of many types of sins, especially the sins of the heart. 
such as pride, self-admiration, riya, etc. So a person may be con committing many of these sins without even realizing it. And this is considered a form of rejecting knowledge, as well as a lack of insight and understanding. That a person may not be aware that in his statements, he's expressing, for example, pride. You know, this is something which is one of the major evils. It is a major sin. The Prophet ﷺ had said that the person who has a mustard seed worth of pride will not enter paradise. I mean, it's very serious. You know, Satan, his rejection of Allah's command was based on what? Pride. So it is a really insidious sin of the heart, pride. But society has been so inundated with things which encourage pride in self, you know, where for a person to be humble, have humility, etc., this is looked down upon. You should be proud, be able to speak with confidence. And these are things which are encouraged that, you know, personality, you should be proud of yourself. But actually, this is not what Islam is about. Islam doesn't encourage this. Proud of your Islam, yes. Proud of your Islam, that you will defend it, you will stand by it, thick and thin. Yes. But proud of yourself, your achievements, what you've done, who you are, etc. No. No. Islam doesn't encourage this. It encourages humility. You know, this is, this is the complete opposite. And pride, we have pride in country, you know, nation. I remember reading some years back in a newspaper where in Pakistan, a father and his son was watching a football game. Oh no, it was a cricket, cricket game between India and Pakistan, right? And his son was cheering the Indian side. The father got so angry when India won that he took, you know, a book, uh, one of these book uh, uh, supports for the books, but a heavy wooden one, smashed his son in the head and killed him. This is pride. Pride over, you know, Pakistan and the Pakistan. But really, if you look at the Pakistani cricket team, these individuals and their lifestyles, are they good representatives of Islam so you should be proud about them? Astaghfirullah. No, they're known for corruption. It's not something to be proud of. But this has been drilled into people that, you know, we should, you should be proud of your country. You know? So, this is among the sins of the heart which a person may not realize because we have been fed it from youth. You grew up with it. Proud to be an American. You know, <laughs> hey, hey, you know this is a uh, fine Muslim saying this. You know, they will say, I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> what is an American? What is it about being an American that you should be proud about? Are you talking about an American Indian? <laughs> right? Because that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about the American who came to the shores of, you know, from Europe to North America, massacred the inhabitants who are known as American Indians or Red Indians or Native Americans, is the popular name now. Right? They were massacred. Massacred, literally massacred. So much so, scholars said that they estimate the number of Indians that were in America at the time when the first European settlers came to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 million. The number of Native Americans in America today is just a little over 2 million. So imagine, 
over 500 years, the number went from 10 million to 2 million. That's with people having given birth and everything else. That means massacre on a scale. Now people talk about the, the, the Jews being massacred, right? The Nazis in uh, Germany. So much so that for the Jews, there is a memorial in Washington for the Jews who were massacred in Germany. What about the Indians, the Native Americans? If anybody should have a monument, it should be them. They were massacred in a scale, you know, beyond imagination. So, so what American are we proud of being? The one who massacred all those Indians? This is something we should be ashamed of, really. But people are raised with that. And unfortunately, I mean, that is the West. But we have it also in the East. You know, we have people of the Gulf. Many people come in this area and, you know, they... You know, we, we came to Arabia thinking we're coming to the land of Islam and, you know, the Sahaba and... <laughs> then they run into the, uh, the local people here and they find these people with such arrogance. You know, simply because you are not a whatever, you know. <laughs> you are looked down upon, you know, you are... Pride, proud. Unfortunate, it's a major disease, a disease of the heart. So a person growing up in our times, being fed this from childhood, may not realize it. You may be expressing it in different ways and phrases and comments and things that you say and you don't even know it. You know, so it is something that we have to tackle. Pride. To know who we really are, we have to look inside of our hearts and tackle this. Put ourselves in the proper relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the rest of his creatures. And Shaykh Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, closing this, that is one who is granted wisdom. And whoever has been given wisdom has been given great good. In that statement, he has interpolated a verse from the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Whoever has been given wisdom has been given a great good. And that understanding, which is established in the heart, which affects our actions, external actions, matching what we know internally, that this is really wisdom. This is the true wisdom. This is a blessing from Allah SWT. Of course, we judge wisdom as being a person is wise, you know, they're old and wise. They've lived life, they've experienced life, etc. This is wisdom. This is an aspect of wisdom. But the true wisdom is this one. The wisdom which is based in the heart, which guides the individual to do the right thing. Whenever the circumstance calls for it, he or she is patient and they will do what they know to be right. That is real wisdom. Because if we actually stop and think of the consequence of doing what we know to be wrong, how grave the consequence is, then surely we wouldn't do it. We would say, what a foolish person to do and bring all of that on himself, to oppress himself in that way. So it is true wisdom to do what we know to be right. And that it spring from our hearts and not just be external actions. And this is why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he made an exception in terms of jealousy. <coughs> when he forbade jealousy, he made the exception with regards to wisdom. He said, jealousy is only allowed in two cases. A person who Allah has given wealth and spends it in righteousness. And a person whom Allah has given wisdom and he judges by it 
and teaches it to others. This is the exception. A person given wealth and spends it in righteousness. Jealousy just for the wealth? No. But jealousy, but jealousy for the person with wealth who spends it in righteousness. We wish we had that wealth to do as that person did. And wisdom. The person who is given wisdom and judges by it and teaches it to others. Ali ibn Abi Talib, oh sorry, Ali ibn Abi Talha reported that Ibn Abbas had said, Wisdom, hikmah, is knowledge of the Quran. That is the first source, that is divine revelation. For instance, he included in that the abrogating verses, the abrogated verses, the clear, the unclear, etc., etc. You know, this is where hikmah, wisdom begins with the Quran. And this is why for anybody who strives for wisdom, who strives to purify the heart, etc., they must begin with the Quran. That is the beginning point. And people, they differ in their depth of understanding of the Quran as well as other knowledge. An example of this can be seen by those who read the tafsir of Shaykh Abdurrahman ibn Nasir al-Sa'di. For example, he derived 50 rulings and principles and lessons from just the verse of wudu in Surah Al-Ma'idah. 50. The verse on wudu in Surah Al-Ma'idah. 20 lessons from the 26 lessons from the story of Dawood and Sulaiman in Surah Sa'd. And more than 46 lessons from Surah Yusuf. And 36 from the story of Musa and Khidr in Surah Al-Kahf. So, Wisdom is to be sought and we should seek it from purification of the heart, from whatever prevents us from achieving that practice matching belief, what we know, what we've understood, practice matching it, it is prevented by the variety of diseases of the heart. So what he's discussing here is for us to understand the need for purifying the heart, cleaning the heart of things which would stop it from gaining true wisdom. Inshallah, we'll stop here. We have the lecture of uh, our brother Dr. Zakir Naik coming up shortly, give you all time to get there. Uh, we'll save any questions you have for the next session, inshallah, next Friday. Okay. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, nashadu wa la ilaha la ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Inna alhamdulillah, inna ahmadu wa nasta'inu wa nastaghfiru, wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ar Rasulillah. All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. In our previous circle on the book, Essay on the Heart, uh, we were on page six of the book which you have, and we basically looked at the third paragraph. The righteousness and correction for the heart, for which the heart was created, is that it understands things. I do not say that it only knows things, 
for someone could know something and not understand it. He could even be negligent of it or reject it. The one who understands something is one who is able to specify its limitations, accurately define it, be conscious of it and confirm it in his heart. In time of need it is sufficient for him and his actions match his statements. His internal is the same as his external. That is one who is granted wisdom and whoever has been granted or has been given wisdom has been given a great good. That is as far as we covered in the last uh, session. And in it we looked at the rightness, as we said, the rightness of the heart, or when is the, right, the heart in a state which we consider to be righteous, uh, when is the heart acting in the correct fashion, that is the way in which Allah created it to act. And we said it's when the heart knows things, it understands things, and not just uh, knows it from the point of view of having knowledge of it but it has understand the the implications of that knowledge and it is manifest in his or her actions in that the internal acts the internal uh, deeds match the external the deeds of the heart coincide and agree with the deeds of the limbs. That the person is not doing one thing and inside themselves, in their hearts, their souls, their hearts are doing something else. Uh, they are free from hypocrisy, these are different aspects of hypocrisy. Or free from riya, these are different uh, aspects of, we could say, contradiction uh, between the external deeds and the internal deeds of the heart. And Ibn Taymiyyah identified that state as being one of true good and true wisdom. When Allah says that whoever has been given wisdom has been given a great good. And following that, he went on to make a quote from Abu Darda. Abu Darda is one of the Sahaba whose actual name was Uwaymir ibn Amir from the tribe of Khazraj. Uh, that's the, one of the main Medina tribes. And he accepted Islam after the Battle of Badr. However, he participated in the Battle of Uhud and those following it. The Prophet ﷺ made him the brother of Salman al-Farisi when they came to Medina. And he was among the leading jurists, among the companions, and among the few who settled in Damascus. Uh, some of the younger companions like Anas ibn Malik, Abu Umama, Abdullah ibn Umar and ibn Abbas, they narrated hadith from him. So he was from uh, an, the, the earlier stage of the leading companions from the earlier stage. Though he wasn't from Mecca, he was from Medina. Um, his wife uh, is particularly noted in uh, one of the hadiths or athar describing her as praying in the same way that the men prayed. There's a famous athar which uh, Sheikh Nasruddin al-Bani quotes in his book Sifatul Salat al-Nabi as one of the evidences that there is no distinction between the prayer of the man and the prayer of the woman. So Umm al-Darda, she was described by those around her the, amongst the tabi'at, the female students of the uh, Sahaba, that she used to pray in the same way that the men prayed. At any rate, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah quotes him as saying, some people are given knowledge and are not given judgment. Indeed, Shaddad ibn Aus was among those given both knowledge and judgment. And the term used for 
judgment here is hukum. Uh, he mentions here Shaddad ibn Aus, who is the son of Thabit. It's Shaddad ibn Aus ibn Thabit. And he was also from the Khazraj tribe of Medina and was the nephew of Hassan ibn Thabit, who was the poet of the Prophet. That the Prophet Muhammad had a poet who, though the Quran condemns poetry, and the Prophet had made a number of statements with regards to poetry. Among them that it would be better for a person's stomach to be filled with pus than to be filled with poetry. His insides be filled with poetry. So he spoke against poetry, but this is, of course is, is the general trend of poetry. The equivalent of which is the music of today. The songs, you know, this is poetry. Modern poetry put to music. The vast majority of it is corruption. And this is why you have the general statements of the Quran opposed to poetry. However, there is an element of it which was good. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did recognize and spoke well of some of the poets who used to speak about Tawheed and things like this. And whenever the pagan tribes would come to visit the Prophet Sallallahu and they would bring along with them their poets, you know, who would then recite praises of their people and uh, as a means of boasting, you know, then the Prophet Sallallahu would call Hassan to respond to them. You know, who would, he would respond with Islamic poetry. Right? So, there is a place uh, for poetry where it is kept within the bounds. And uh, Shaddad ibn, ibn Aus, as we said, was the nephew of Hassan ibn Thabit. And um, he lived basically in Syria, died in Palestine, he was a scholar of that area. At any rate, Abu Darda praised him as having both knowledge and judgment. Having both knowledge and this judgment, really a sense of good judgment to make the right choice. You know, um, you may have knowledge about an issue, but how to uh, discernment, which gives you the inner understanding of how to apply that knowledge, you may lack it. Right? And uh, we find actually in many places in the Quran where Allah speaks about the prophets, you know, being given scripture and prophethood, and He adds along with it and judgment. Al Hukum, wal Nubuwa. You know, you see this is repeated in many places. For example, Prophet Isa is spoken of in this way in Surah Ali Imran, verse 79. It is not befitting for a human being that Allah give him scripture, judgment, and prophethood. Then he tell people, worship me instead of Allah. <coughs> also we find in Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah talks about Prophet Lut, saying, I gave Lut judgment and knowledge. And uh, Prophet Musa, Allah says, and when he reached adulthood and matured, I gave him judgment and knowledge. You know, so this issue of hukum, you know, is mentioned in a number of different places. And Dawood and Sulaiman were particularly noted for this wisdom this discernment and Allah said in their case in Surah Al-Anbiya he said when Dawood and Sulaiman uh, when uh, oh, gave judgment concerning the, the field in which a people's sheep grazed at night I was witness to their judgment and I made Sulaiman understand it and to each I gave wisdom hukum the same hukum and knowledge both of them were given it but Sulaiman had a deeper insight. This case actually, uh, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, he had narrated that Ibn Mas'ud had said that grapes which had ripened and their bunches, this is what he was referring to, this uh, field in which the people's sheep grazed. He said it was a field of grapes in which had ripened and their bunches were spoiled by sheep. Dawood ruled that the owner of the grapes should keep the sheep. Sulaiman said, not like this, O Prophet of Allah. Dawood asked, how then? He replied, give the grapes to the owner of the sheep and let him tend them until they grow back as they were. And give the sheep 
to the owner of the grapes and let him benefit from them until the grapes have grown back as they were. Then the grapes should be given back to their owner and the sheep back to their owner. This is the wisdom of Prophet Sulaiman. And even Allah we find in many places in the Quran describes himself using these phrases, phrases in you know, Hakimun Alim or Azizun Hakim, this concept of Hakim, you know, is, is mentioned throughout the Quran. And of course this relates back for Muslims uh, when Allah speaks about this sense of wisdom uh, in terms of our own acceptance of Islam that when we have internalized this attribute of Allah being the Hakim, having the Hukum in the ultimate sense, then we don't resist any judgments which Allah has made for us. We don't fight it. Because our fighting any judgment which Allah has made is an, is an expression of our distrust in Allah's judgment. If He has made a ruling on a particular uh, issue, then for the believers, there is no room for question, for doubt, <coughs> for hesitation. We're supposed to accept it because Allah describes them for you sell taslima. They just submit themselves completely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this statement actually which Ibn Taymiyyah mentions uh, and he attributes it, attributes it back to Abu Darda uh, the source of it uh, was not identified and um, Shaykh Salim al-Hilali who had uh, edited the book in Arabic he didn't find the source either I wasn't able to find it myself but there is a reference in um, Al-Isaba, which is a book on the lives of the Sahaba, in which Ubada ibn Samit, another companion of the Prophet ﷺ, he is reported to have said, Shaddad ibn Aus was among those few who were given knowledge and discernment. And he uses the term Hilm instead. And among people are those given only one of them. It's quite possible that this is the actual narration and uh, Ibn Taymiyyah it may have slipped him, attributed to, to the wrong source. Anyway, the point is that uh, this was just a, uh, an issue for the purpose of stressing the importance or the greatness of the blessing of one who is given both knowledge and wisdom. And Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, this is the case in spite, this is the case, meaning that it is, it is a great blessing from Allah to be given both uh, wisdom, uh, knowledge and wisdom, in spite of the fact that people vary in their ability to understand things from perfect to deficient. And in the amount that they understand from a lot to a little, and from general to the precise. Some people are granted a higher and deeper understanding than others. In general, one of the primary causes to attain higher understanding is taqwa. Higher understanding, one of the major sources or means by which we can achieve it is through taqwa. That is, to do acts of obedience and worship sincerely seeking Allah's pleasure and to stay away from all sins, major and minor, internal and external, out of fear of his punishment. Where we seek to put a shield between ourselves and the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah in ver different verses of the Quran has made this reference uh, directly saying, for example, in the 8th chapter verse 29, Ya amanu in Allah. يَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ فُرْقَانًا O you who believe, if you have taqwa of Allah, if you fear Allah, He will provide you with a clear criterion to distinguish between truth and falsehood. And also Allah said, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ 
have taqwa or fear of Allah and Allah will teach you. Ibn al-Qayyim addressing this concept had said this understanding is a blessing granted by Allah to his slaves and a light by which he will know and comprehend that which others do not know and comprehend. Though the two people can be equal in the knowledge they have memorized and equal in their basic understanding of the text. But that inner light, that inner uh, understanding, this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this ability may vary from circumstance to circumstance. The fact that a person may have it in one instant or given one particular circumstance doesn't mean that he has it in all. It may also vary in degree and it may vary from subject to subject. You may find a given scholar in a given area which is his area of specialization he has that deeper knowledge but in other areas which are not areas of his specialization he his knowledge is more general and we would mention when we talked about the life of Ibn Taymiyyah but one of the distinguishing characteristics of Ibn Taymiyyah was that any subject that he spoke on it seemed to be his area of specialization he seemed to have this deep understanding no matter whether he was talking about comparative religion you know whether he's dealing with the Christians and the Jews and their ideas with their text etc or whether he was talking about usul al-fiqh or whether he's talking about usul al-hadith or tafsir or whatever subject he entered into he seemed to be a master of that subject and as we mentioned from the time he was 19 years old you know people were coming to him scholars were coming to him for fatwas Allahu Akbar Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say that these three organs are the main means of gaining knowledge and understanding it of understanding what is liked and disliked and of distinguishing between those doing good for a person and those doing evil etc by knowledge I mean the knowledge which distinguishes between humans and other animals outside of what they share with them like smell, taste and touch. The three organs of course that he's referring to here are the hearing, sight and the hearts. Adult humans are able to understand or deduce the hidden reasons behind actions. Right? while animals and children are not is one of the distinguishing characteristics of adulthood for example a cow may be fed regularly in order to fatten it to be slaughtered and eaten relative to the cow you're feeding it regularly it's a good thing it seems uh, you know it's a nice person the cow will like you but he's not able to grasp the fact that you have another intention behind feeding him that you intend to kill him and eat him afterwards right so he's not able to make that that distinction right similarly with children uh, they're not able to understand the intentions behind things they can only deal with the act and this is why we find the sharia you know freeing them of obligation you know until they reach adulthood and also why you know there are uh, laws even in non-muslim society which you know prevent uh, adults from taking advantage of children because for the child you only need to have a candy you know and uh, the child's eyes are open and they'll do anything for that candy and of course this is a great danger that's the nature of why children have to be protected uh, in the society with the greatest of care now Ibn Taymiyyah in speaking about these three organs he downplays the sense of smell taste and touch however even these senses can provide knowledge when it is interpreted by the mind the human mind for example something might smell good taste nice and feel comfortable and yet be harmful or it may smell bad, taste terrible, 
and feel uncomfortable yet be beneficial right? the human mind is able to see beyond what the senses uh, perceive see what's behind it see the harm that may not be obvious from the surface so this is in the case really of all of the senses though Ibn Taymiyyah focuses on these three and that is because of the fact that these are the main three these are the main sources but then these are the ones which throughout the Quran you find mentioned time and time again these three repeatedly we find Ibn Taymiyyah uh, quoting uh, a series of verses from the Quran in support of that for example in Surah Nahal verse 78 where Allah says Wallahu akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum la ta'alamuna shay'a wa ja'ala lakum as-sam'a wal absara wal af'ida la'allakum tashkurun Allah extracted you from the wombs of your mothers while you knew nothing and made for you hearing sight and hearts that perhaps you would give thanks hearing sight and hearts and Allah in this verse uh, does mention the fact that it is he who takes you from the wombs though physically we know it is the contraction of the womb of the mother that drives the child out but Allah says he takes you from the wombs because this contraction is not something which is uh, controllable meaning a woman can decide okay it's time to have some contractions so I'll have some contractions now this is something beyond her control this is something from Allah Allah has put it to send that child out so he attributes the coming out of the child to himself and you will find this in a number of verses in the Quran where Allah attributes certain actions of human beings of his creation to himself Be either because he wants to ennoble that action gives it a special status or he wants to remind human beings that he is the one behind it even though they might think that they are the ones doing it now Ibn Kathir mentions here concerning this verse this is in Tafsir Ibn Kathir Allah mentions his blessings to his servants in that he brought them from their mother's wombs not knowing anything then he gave, gives them hearing to recognize voices sight to see visible things and hearts meaning reason whose seat according to the correct view is in the heart although it was also said that the seat is in the brain with reason a person can distinguish between what is harmful and what is beneficial these abilities and senses gradually develop in a human being the more he grows the more his hearing vision and reason increase until they reach their peak Allah has created these faculties in human beings to enable them to worship their Lord so they use all these organs abilities and powers to obey their master so these are gifts from Allah and they are for the purpose of enabling human beings to worship Allah in the best way then Ibn, in, Ibn Kathir quotes a hadith from Abu Huraira saying Allah says whoever takes my friend as an enemy this is called hadith Qudsi because Prophet Sallallahu is quoting Allah Allah says whoever takes my friend as an enemy has declared war on me my servant doesn't draw near to me with anything more beloved to me than his doing what I have enjoined upon him and my servant keeps drawing nearer to me by doing voluntary deeds until I love him and when I love him I become his hearing with which he hears his vision with, with which he sees his hand with which he grasps and his foot with which he walks were he to ask me for anything I would give it to him and if he were to call on me I would respond if he were to seek refuge in me I would grant it to him I do not hesitate to do anything as much as I hesitate to take the soul of my believing servant because he hates death and I hate to harm him this is in Sahih al-Bukhari now the meaning of this hadith Ibn Kathir goes on to say is that when a person is sincere in his obedience to Allah all his deeds are done for the sake of Allah so he hears only for the sake of Allah he only sees for the sake of Allah meaning he only listens to or looks at what is allowed by Allah he does not grasp or walk except in obedience of Allah seeking Allah's help in all of these things then Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to mention a verse from Surah Sajda 
Then he made him and blew in him from his spirit and made for you hearing, sight, and hearts. But rarely you give thanks. In this verse again, Allah is pointing out that these powers, these faculties are gifts from Allah and we should be thankful to Allah for them. Thankful not meaning merely saying Jazakumullah, you know, or Jazakallah, or you know, Ashkuruka ya Allah, or you know, these phrases which we might say routinely, but by using these faculties in the way which Allah has prescribed, then we give true thanks to Him. This is where the true thanks is expressed. It becomes real. The following verse in Surah Al-Isra, Ibn Taymiyyah mentions as another evidence, verse 36. Do not say what you have no knowledge of. Indeed, the hearing, sight, and heart will all be questioned. Qatada, one of the students of the Sahaba, had said, This meant that you should not say, I have seen when you have not seen, or I have heard when you have heard nothing, or I know when you don't know, for Allah will ask you about all of that. Ibn Kathir goes on to say after mentioning this, in conclusion, what he says means that Allah forbids speaking without knowledge and only on the basis of suspicion, which is mere imagination and illusions. Allah says, avoid most suspicions, for some suspicions are sinful. Right, this is dhan, where Allah tells us to avoid suspicion uh, because there is a danger in suspicion. We hear things and that suspicion, where we have suspicion about people, can lead us to then spread slander and lies. If we keep ourselves free from suspicion, when people bring false information to us, our first reaction will be to verify to question them. Do you have evidence for this? You know, what you're saying is a form of slander or backbiting or whatever. You know, they will be uh, immunized from backbiting if they free themselves from suspicion because suspicion is where is the, is the you could say, the fertile ground for slander. And the Prophet ﷺ had said in a hadith narrated by Abu Huraira, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالظَّنَّ فَإِنَّ الظَّنَّ أَكْذَبُ الْحَدِيثِ Beware of suspicion, for suspicion is the most false form of speech. And Ibn Abbas had quoted the Prophet Muhammad as saying, and this is a very serious point regarding something which we may take as some quite simple, where people may speak about dreams to impress other people, you know. Of course, the ultimate case is when a person says he or she dreamt that they saw the Prophet you know. In a gathering, somebody mentions that, everybody says, Oh, Allah Akbar. So this was not to be left out, somebody else adds, Well, yeah, I saw the Prophet also. <coughs> because of course, Prophet did say, You know, whoever has seen me in a dream has seen me. Because Satan cannot take my form. However, the companions, when people brought this to them, used to question them and ask, well, what did he look like? Now, just enough to say, I saw him in a dream, but what did he look like? Now, if he's described as having this huge green turban, you know, and, you know, dressed in a uh, shalwar or khamis, you know, the t typical Pakistani outfit, you know, or whatever, you know, which is maybe the image that the person has of what the Prophet ﷺ should look like, a pious man, if it doesn't match, he never used to wear that particular dress. He didn't used to wear a big green turban on his head. You know, then we say, no. Or they described him in one, you know, other descriptions of him which don't match, then we reject it. It's rejected. We only, it's only accepted if, if his description matches what is mentioned in the authentic traditions of the Prophet Muhammad Anyway, the Prophet had said in a hadith narrated by Ibn Abbas, Whoever claims to have seen a dream 
not just him in a dream, but just to see a dream in general. Whoever claims to have seen in a dream, he didn't see, he claims he has seen a dream which he didn't see, he will be given the assignment of making a knot between two grains of barley and he will never be able to do it. He'll be given the assignment. Obviously, when is this? Day of judgment. He'll be given the assignment. That will be his trial to do this which he cannot do. And of course, that is humiliation. Of course, you will want to do it because you want to do what Allah has commanded you to do and you are unable to do it. Meaning failure, meaning punishment. So it is something very serious you know, to talk even about dreams which we didn't see. Now Ibn Kathir had mentioned when Allah said in this verse, indeed the hearing sight and heart will all be questioned. That this means that the person will be asked about them on the day of judgment and they will be asked about him and what he did. We have other verses where Allah speaks about putting a seal over the people's mouths and their skins, their hands, etc. Their body parts will give witness against them. Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to mention the verse from Surah Al-Ahqaf, verse 26. وَجَعْلَ لَهُمْ سَمْعًا وَأَبْصَارَ وَأَفْئِدَةً He made for them hearing, sight, and hearts. And in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 7, Allah sealed their hearts, hearing and sight with a veil. Qatada spoke on this verse saying that Satan controlled them when they obeyed him. Therefore Allah sealed their hearts, hearing and sight, and they could neither see guidance nor hear and understand. Mujahid added, it occurs when sin resides in the heart and surrounds it from all sides. And this submersion of the heart in sin constitutes a stamp, meaning a seal. The stain is not as bad as the stamp, which is not as bad as the lock, which is the worst type. And then he demonstrated the difference between the three. He said, referring to the companions, they used to say that the heart is like this, and we don't put out an open palm. When the servant commits a sin, a part of the heart will be rolled up and he would roll up his index finger. When the servant commits another sin, a part of the heart will be rolled up. Then he rolled up another finger. And he would continue in sin until the fingers all rolled up. Then that is the lock, he said. Then the heart will be sealed. Now, in Tafsir al-Qurtubi, Imam al-Qutubi had said that the Ummah was of the unanimous opinion that Allah described himself as sealing and locking the hearts of believe, disbelievers as a punishment for their disbelief. As a punishment for their disbelief. He then quoted from Surah An-Nisa, verse 155, بَلْ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهَا بِكُفْرِهِمْ Rather, Allah sealed them because of their disbelief. And then he mentioned the hadith of Hudayfa. Which Prophet ﷺ said, Trials will be presented before the heart, just as straws are woven into a mat, one after another. Any heart which accepts the trials will have a black spot engraved on it. And any heart which rejects the trials will have a white spot engraved on it. Hearts will be in two categories, white like barren rock, no trials will harm this category as long as the heavens and the earth exists. Another category will be black, like a cup turned upside down. This heart doesn't recognize righteousness or renounce evil, but only what its desires feed upon. Islam initiated as something strange. This is uh, Imam al qutbi goes on to say, and it would revert to its position of strangeness. So give glad tidings to the strangers. Now Imam Qurtubi raised this point in response to those who claimed that there was no free will since Allah sealed the hearts. Because this is what 
Some people may interpret from that phrase where Allah said he has sealed the hearts. Meaning now you had no free will. So whatever you do is evil. This is because Allah sealed your hearts. But why did he seal your hearts? Is it just because he didn't like you? It is arbitrary. He just picks and chooses amongst human beings. Those he doesn't like, he seals their hearts. Those he likes, he gives them guidance. No. It is because of their repeated uh, sin, their continuation in sin, their rejection of the truth, that Allah seals their heart as a consequence of their actions. And Ibn Taymiyyah went on to say, and he said the following concerning the deeds and power required of every one of these organs. I have created for hell many jinns and humans who have hearts but do not understand with them, eyes but do not see with them, and ears but do not hear with them. Ibn Kathir said, this meant that they do not benefit from these senses that Allah created for them as a means of gaining guidance. He said about the hypocrites, they are deaf, dumb and blind, so they do not return to the right path. And about the disbelievers, they are deaf, dumb and blind, so they do not understand. Now this verse, which uh, Ibn Taymiyyah mentions from Surah Al-A'raf, verse 179, the completion of it is, أُولَٰئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلْ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْغَافِلُونَ They are like cattle, rather they are more astray. They are those who are heedless. Ibn Kathir said, Those who neither hear the truth nor understand it, nor see guidance, are just like grazing cattle. They do not benefit from these senses except for what sustains their life in this world. Allah said in a similar verse, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 171, And the example of those who disbelieve is that of one who shouts to those who hear nothing but the call and cries. Meaning that their example, when they are called to faith, is the example of cattle that hear only the voice of their shepherd, but cannot understand what he is saying. Allah further described them, rather they are more astray. Balhum adal. They are even more astray than cattle, because the cattle still respond to the call of the shepherd. So the cattle can't understand the words of what the shepherd is saying. They know when the shepherd gives the call, they come. So at least they respond. Whereas for people described, uh, the disbelievers and the hypocrites, they do not respond at all. Even though they've understood and they heard the call, they don't, under, they don't respond. So they are not like cattle because the cattle at least fulfilled their purpose and the service for which they were created. Whereas the disbeliever was created to worship Allah alone, but he disbelieved in Allah and associated others in his worship. Therefore those people who disobey Allah, who <coughs> obey Allah, sorry, are more honorable than some angels, while cattle are better than those who disbelieve in him. So, in, in, with regards to these qualities which Allah has given, as human beings, we are required to recognize them as mercies and blessings which Allah has given us. And that they have a purpose. Not that we use them anyhow, anyway, but we have a responsibility to use our faculties in a way in which is pleasing to Allah and as such their use becomes an act of worship. Meaning we can worship Allah with our eyes. Normally when people say this, we think of a person in a situation where he cannot move any of his limbs, so he has to make recourse to Jude using his eyes. But no, it goes beyond that. If we look at the things which are pleasing to Allah, and we abstain from looking at the things displeasing to Allah, then we are worshipping Allah with our eyes. I mean, that is the vastness of Islam. That even our eyes can worship Allah, we can gain righteous deeds through just using our eyes as Allah had prescribed that they be used. Similarly, our hearing, that we only listen to the things which are pleasing to Allah. When we find ourselves in circumstances where people are talking about things displeasing to Allah, we advise those people and if they refuse, we leave them. We don't sit in their presence. And this becomes an act of worship by us controlling what we hear 
seeking only to listen what is pleasing to Allah, then we worship Allah with our ears. And of course, with our hearts, ultimately, this is the ultimate level of worship. Because this is the essence of the individual, and this is the essence of where worship lies. Because even the eyes that we worship with, the ears that we worship with, this is as a result of the heart. And that's what Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to discuss in the chapter following it. The prominence of the heart. The heart being above those other two. Though Allah mentions all three together and He even mentions the heart last, the heart is ultimately the most prominent. Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, although all three are mentioned together, the eye is inferior to the heart and the ear. It is different from them in that it only sees things that are present and corporal, like images and objects. On the other hand, the heart and ears enable one to know about spiritual and theoretical things that are invisible and intangible. Furthermore, even these two are different in that the heart understands things by itself, and knowledge is its nourishment and its specialty. As for the ear, it merely carries words containing knowledge to the heart. In itself, it captures statements and words, and when they reach the heart, the heart extracts from them the knowledge they contain. So really all of the senses, they share the same uh, principle, that it's the heart which does the interpreting. The understanding is really with the heart. So though Allah speaks about the eyes and the ears being responsible, it is really the heart which is behind the eyes and ears that are responsible. Punishing the ears, punishing the heart, the, the eyes, of course, this is of no value. This is why when uh, Allah speaks about the punishment, for example, in the hellfire, Allah talks about the hellfire as surrounding the hearts. He doesn't speak about surrounding the eyes and the ears, you know. He speaks about surrounding the hearts. And the focus is on the heart because this is ultimately where the punishment lies as it's ultimately where belief and disbelief lies. Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, the master of knowledge in reality is the heart. The remainder of the organs and limbs are gate men to whom information reaches which they are unable to acquire by themselves. It is the master to the degree that whoever loses any of the other organs loses only the knowledge that was conveyed through it. Thus the deaf person is unable to gain knowledge about speech and the blind person is unaware of vast knowledge contained uh, vast knowledge objects contained. Likewise, whoever looks at things without participation of the heart or listens to words of the scholars without participation of the heart does not understand anything. Thus the pivot of affairs is the heart. Here the wisdom of, is the wisdom of Allah's statement or the wisdom of Allah's statement becomes clear. Won't they travel in the land that they have hearts to understand or ears to hear with? When Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned concerning the deaf and the blind, he said, and the blind person is unaware of the vast knowledge objects contain. What he meant by that is that a blind person who feels the surface, for example, of a pyramid or a space shuttle cannot understand the history behind them by a sense of touch. There's huge wisdom, huge information behind what he can touch. He can figure out shapes in terms of what he is touching, but what is behind it is unable to grasp. Anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls on people to travel in the land, to reflect on the stories concerning the terrible ends that befell those who denied the truth. Also in Surah Qaf, Allah says, in that is a reminder for those for whoever has a heart or listens attentively. Listening attentively, of course, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, it means hears the speech, comprehends and understands it in his mind and grasps its implication by his intellect. So this issue of, of attentiveness, of whatever we do, 
being conscious, being aware that the heart participates is very, very important, uh, which it is, it is that participation of the heart which turns acts from being mundane, physical, daily acts into worship. When the heart participates, as the scholars mentioned that when we put an intention behind anything we do, for example, in the morning you drink a glass of juice and you eat an egg. This is a mubah act. According to Islamic law, it's mubah. It's permissible to you. If you're starving to death, it becomes obligatory to prevent yourself from dying. But as a normal act, it is mubah. But now, if your heart participates, and this is something very subtle, the heart participates in drinking apple juice and eating an egg. How does the heart participate in it? It participates by putting an intention behind it. I am drinking this apple juice and eating this egg in order that I have the strength, the bodily strength to be able to worship Allah or to do jihad if the time arises, you know, or whatever acts of, of uh, righteousness that we can do this gives us the strength to do it. Once we put that intention, then drinking that glass of juice, eating that egg, becomes an act of righteousness and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the concept of having the heart participate in the acts. And of course, this is when Prophet ﷺ told us to say Bismillah before whatever we do. This, is, this was the intent that the heart participate in our actions. Anything of importance that we want to do, we say Bismillah before. Bismillah before eating, etc. Et Bismillah can be a guide for us in what we can do and what we can't do. Sometimes people ask the questions, you know, sometimes I go on the internet, you know, and these things come up and at me and blah, blah, you know, and I end up... What some people advise is, whenever you turn on the internet, internet Say Bismillah. Whenever you start to search, say Bismillah. Now if you can't say Bismillah before turning on the internet because it means you are planning to go in for something you shouldn't be going in for, that is telling you that this is evil. Stay away from it. Before you make that search, if you can't say Bismillah, then this is telling you you shouldn't be there. So Bismillah, this of course is with the uh, the, um, the heart being involved with the involvement of the heart because of course technically speaking of course a disbeliever or whatever can just say Bismillah and do it you may even find ignorant Muslims saying Bismillah and taking a bottle of alcohol people tell me that people doing that in Russia you know in southern Russia Muslim states people have been under communism for so long you know their knowledge of Islam is down to a mere minimum Certain things they remember, Bismillah. So you might find them in their functions, you know, they gather for weddings and they pass around the alcohol. Bismillah, everybody takes a drink. So yeah. Well, this is without the participation of the heart. They have not understood what Bismillah meant and what they have not understood the meaning behind it which should now guide them and stop them from corruption. So the concept of participation of the heart is of course a very vital concept. This goes back even to things like reading of the Qur'an, you know, where Allah speaks about reflection on the Qur'an, you know, people reading the Qur'an, afalaya tadabbaroon al-Qur'an, will they not reflect on the Qur'an? Or are their hearts locked up? Because the heart, when it's locked up, it's not participating in the act. So we go through the rote act of reading the Qur'an. Yes, we should read Qur'an every day, so we take it out. We only know the Arabic text, and we do it every day. The impact. What does it do? What changes can it make? What benefit is up is it ultimately? So it is critical for us that whatever act we do, whether it acts be acts of worship or even acts that we don't consider to be worship, that we try to have our hearts participate in whatever we do.
Uh, we'll stop here, inshallah, and um, give you a chance for questions, which I didn't manage to do in the last couple of sec sessions. So if you have any questions, that I'll ask you to store them up, bring them along until we had a chance. You know, now is the chance for you to ask any questions that you would like on the topic, naturally. Okay, our brother's um, comment uh, concerning the issue of knowledge and taqwa. You know, knowledge where people having limited knowledge uh, are giving fatwas or rulings on critical issues without a real foundation. Uh, the danger of this. And um, as Muslims, we actually become responsible in many cases regarding this. Wherein, if we hear, as the example he gave, that somebody accepted Islam, so and so was a famous pop singer, you know, very popular, he accepted Islam. And he comes, you know, bring him to give a talk. So he gives a talk on why he accepted Islam. Alhamdulillah, wonderful. But then after that, you will find the Muslims starting to ask him to give fatwas. You know, on fiqh issues, you know. And, you know, if he has taqwa, then he will say and stop and say, well, you know, this is not my area. I don't have any knowledge on this. I just can tell you what I... But unfortunately, you all do have people who, when put in this position, they ask questions, they start to answer and give their opinions. And, you know, of course, it's uh, very dangerous, misleading. And, uh, you know, that's why it's very important that we beware of giving rulings. Because Prophet ﷺ had said, there are three types of judges. People give rulings, three types. Two in hell and one in paradise. The one who has no knowledge and gives a ruling, whether he's right or wrong, is in hell. So the person who has no knowledge, they give a ruling, they're guessing. And they happen to be right, it's still a sin. The one who has knowledge, but doesn't rule according to his knowledge, is in hell. And the only one going to paradise is the one who has knowledge and rules according to the knowledge, gives the rulings according to the knowledge. So it is a very sensitive area in Islam. That's why Allah stresses in the Quran, Fas'alu ahl al-dhikri in kuntum la ta'alamun, ask those who know if you don't know. 
seeking knowledge, etc. You know, that knowledge has to be respected. You know, knowledge has to be respected. And part of that respect is not to seek it from those who don't have it. Okay, brothers, question that if the issue of intentions, the heart being behind the deeds, if a person does a deed which is not in accordance with the Sunnah, will that person be rewarded? It is possible that he could be rewarded for what he has done. Right? Well, as a basic principle, we know that for deeds to be acceptable to Allah, they must fulfill the condition of one, it being for the sake of Allah, ikhlas. Secondly, that in doing it, one must be conscious of Allah. Right? It's not an involuntary action. And thirdly, that it be done according to the methodology of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam must be done according to the Sunnah. This is the basic principles for the deed to be acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa taala. So now, a person who does a deed which doesn't fulfill the condition of uh, the Sunnah, following the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then it means that that deed, in and of itself, is not a righteous deed is not acceptable to Allah. It is rejected. As Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does a deed which doesn't have our seal of approval on it, it's not acceptable to Allah. It's rejected. We know that. However, going back to intentions, that person, if they had a good intention in doing this deed, and again, I should stress, we're not talking about a person trying to justify haram, a person trying to justify haram with a good intention, and I'm not talking about that category. We're talking about a person thinking that this thing is a good deed, because that is the knowledge which has come to him or her. He lives in a village, all of the knowledge, you know, is that on Laylatul Isra, you know, you're supposed to celebrate it, fast the night, do these things, and they do this for the sake of Allah. Now, the fast, the acts that they did may not be acceptable to Allah because they are innovation. But the intention that they had of trying to do it purely to please Allah, Allah can accept that intention and forgive their acts. That's why we have to be very careful. You know, when we come into light, we come into understanding, the tendency is then to negate everybody else. All of everybody else is going to hell. You know, because they don't have that understanding. Very dangerous. Because we may have that understanding and not act in accordance with that understanding. It become a curse which puts us in hell and they go to paradise. Because they had good intentions. And that was the knowledge that they could grasp at the time that was available to them. And this is evident from the hadith in Sahih Bukhari of the individual when the time of his death came, right, he told his sons to burn his body and take the ashes, sprinkle some of it in the sea and some of it to the winds on the land. <coughs> so he said he did that to do this. He said, because I fear what would happen to me if Allah got a hold of me. Okay. Now that act of burning yourself, throwing your ashes, thinking that Allah will not be able to get a hold of you if you did that, we would say this is kufr. That is kufr. Allah is not able to bring you back together? This is kufr. However, when he, does that, when he did that, Prophet ﷺ said that Allah told the sea and the land to bring his past parts back together. And he was back one in front of Allah. And Allah asked him, why did you do this? And he said, I did it out of fear of you, Allah. And Allah forgave him. And gave him paradise. So, so something which we might 
might appear to us as hey, this we said this is covered. Look, he didn't understand. Look what he did, burned himself like a Hindu. No, it's wrong, incorrect. But his sincerity of intention, and obviously he didn't have access to the correct knowledge. Allah forgave him for it and rewarded him for his intention, not for his act. So, yes, it is possible that that act may not be in accordance with the Sunnah. And that's why we have to be very careful about how we deal with people who are in different states of ignorance in different parts of the Muslim world, you know, who may be doing things which are wrong, bid'ah, and all these other kinds of things. Now, we need to educate them. But we have, that's why we have to beware. We don't just, you know, scorn them, speak ill of them in the sense that they're all going to hell, you are lost, you are this, blah, blah. No, we have to be very careful. I can pick it up for you, inshallah. Um, but it's an authentic, authentic narration. Um, I'm not certain of which book of the hadith it is. But it's well known and uh, without a doubt authentic. ومن استنى بسنة يوم الدين. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on His last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. In the previous session, we looked at the three organs, or body parts which were the main means for gaining knowledge and looked at the various uh, verses in relationship to them and we began to look at the chapter on the prominence of the heart the heart is more prominent than the other two the, the sight and hearing we uh, pointed out that the sight with regards to hearing and the heart was inferior. Uh, I should say this is what Ibn Taymiyyah pointed out. And we gave an example from the book of Ibn Taymiyyah, Surah Al-Hajj, verses 46 in which Allah says there won't they travel in the land and don't they have hearts to understand or ears to hear with in this verse the eyes are not mentioned though Allah is talking about traveling in the land as Ibn Taymiyyah points out sight is not mentioned here as in the previous verses because the context of the statement here is regarding unseen things and the lessons to be understood from the final end of things in which sight has no role. Traveling in the land, coming across the various civilizations of the past, that information can be passed on orally. One doesn't have to see the ruins. In fact, the ruins might be uh, hidden, they may be unclear, but the stories of the past are still handed down, the history is recorded, whether orally or in written form. So knowledge of that history and what happened to the people from the previous generations, that can be gained through the ears and ultimately it is to be understood by the hearts. 
So this is why Allah, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, did not mention the heart, the, the eyes here. Though eyes may play a minor role, the ear and the heart plays the major role. He also mentioned the verse, or do they think that most of them hear and understand? Am tahsabu anna aktharahum yasma'una aw ya'qilun? As, an, as another example, again hearing and understanding are stressed. And he further clarifies this reality in his statement from Surah Qaf, verse 37. Inna fi lahu In that is a reminder for whoever has a heart or listens attentively. And we spoke about uh, what was meant by listening attentively as uh, scholars refer to it as meaning that he hears the speech, he comprehends and understands it and his mind grasps its implications. This is according to the Tafsir of Nikathir. Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, those who have been granted wisdom and benefit from knowledge are on two levels. One, either a person who sees the truth by himself and accepts it and follows it without needing anyone to invite him to it. That is one who truly possesses a heart. The example of that is the Hunafa, people who had chosen to reject idolatry and the evil customs of the Quraysh and the tribal customs in Arabia burying the, uh, child, the girl children you know, alive and a variety of other customs that they practiced there were people who rejected this and sought to worship Allah alone they are generally referred to as the Hunafa Prophet Muhammad وسلم, before he received the revelation was one of them so this is like the first category those who will grasp the truth, meaning that they can recognize misguidance and error in the society without necessarily having somebody to come and tell them. Right? They are one category and they are the minority. The vast majority of people are in the second category, that is of those who are guided. They're in the second category, which Ibn Taymiyyah describes. He says, a person who does not understand the truth by himself, but needs someone to teach it to him, clarify it for him, advise him regarding it, and mold him according, it, according to it. That is an attentive person who listens attentively. That is one whose heart is present and not absent. As Mujahid said, he was given knowledge and it was a reminder for him, for him right? Um, Mujahid uh, Ibn Jabr, he was one of the leading students of Ibn Abbas. And he was the first to have compiled a tafsir of the Quran. However, his tafsir didn't reach us in its original form. Scholars in uh, Mecca University, uh, known as Umm al-Qura, have compiled from the earlier tafsirs of At-Tabari and others, the various narrations attributed to Mujahid and put them together as tafsir Mujahid. So it is available on the market now. But the one which he himself compiled, that is not available. But at least the essence of it is, has been handed down through various narrations and this has been compiled. <coughs> anyway, the significance of Mujahid's tafsir, of course, uh, we all know that Ibn Abbas, he was called Turjuman al-Quran, the interpreter of the meanings of the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ made special dua for him. And he was known, though he was quite young, to have great insight and was blessed with a deep understanding of the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ made the dua for him to that respect. Now, the significance of Mujahid's tafsir is that he said he had gone through the whole Quran twice with Ibn Abbas, stopping at the end of each verse 
and asking him about whom it was revealed and why it was revealed. That was Mujahid. So it means he had a very close access to the knowledge of tafsir from the leading mufassir or scholar of tafsir among the Sahaba. Anyway, um, this uh, Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, the following statement of Allah Almighty then becomes clear, where Allah start, talks about the other side. On one hand, he talks about uh, hearing through the ears, understanding in the heart. Then he talks about the other side of those who can't hear. He says in uh, Surah Yunus, verse 2, Among them are those who listen to you. Will you then make the deaf hear, even if they do not understand? And among them are those who look at you. Will you then make the blind or guide the blind even though they do not see? Right. And also Allah's statement in Surah Al-An'am verse 25 Among them are those who listen to you but I have placed a seal on their hearts so they do not understand and deafness in their ears. Right. Those who reject guidance are able to hear the messenger and see the messenger. However, they are unable to benefit from what they hear and see in a way similar to the deaf and blind who can neither hear nor see. And this is why Allah makes this reference. Now, in terms of Allah questioning, will you make the deaf hear? This asma'ahum you know, asma, this form of causing people to hear. Ibn al-Qayyim said that this is one of the levels of guidance by which Allah guides his slaves. Right? To make them hear. And this hearing, of course, is not the hearing merely of the proofs and evidences for the truth. It is the hearing of the hearts. Right? This Allah can do. But Allah says to the Prophet ﷺ, are you going to do that? Do you think you can do that? No. That type of guidance is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And Allah said, in reference to this kind of guidance, the blind and the seeing are not equal, nor is darkness and light, nor is the shade and the sun's heat. And the living and the dead are not the same. Indeed, Allah causes whom He wills to hear. But you cannot make those in their graves hear. You are only a warner. Your job, in other words, as Surah Fatir, verses 19 and 22 to 22, your job is only to convey the message, not to make them hear, not to make them understand, meaning, in spite of their unwillingness to hear, or to reflect, that you can make them reflect. Hmm? Ibn Taqayim went on to say, this hearing, this level of guidance, refers to hearing of the heart. Speech is composed of words and meanings. So a portion of it goes to the ears and a portion to the heart. Hearing the wording is by the ears, while hearing its true meaning and what is intended is the portion of the heart. So these verses, in these verses Allah negated this type of hearing from the disbelievers. But he confirmed that they possessed the hearing of the ears. He said in Surah Al-Anbiya verses 2 and 3, no admonition from their Lord comes to them as a recent revelation except that they listen to it while they play with their hearts occupied. him. مِنْ ذِكْرٍ مِنْ رَبِّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ مُحْدَثٍ إِلَّا اسْتَمَعُوهُ أو إِلَّا اسْتَمَعُوهُ وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ لَاهِيَةً قُلُوبُهُمْ They're hearing but their hearts are occupied, playful. The ears hear but the hearts don't. This type of hearing does not benefit the listener. 
other than it being a case against him. It becomes proof against him on the day of judgment. But what is intended behind listening its fruits and what it calls for, this does not happen to an occupied, heedless heart that turns away. And Allah refers to in that verse in Surah Al-An'am, I have placed seals on their hearts. Allah refers to him sealing their hearts and ears by himself, as this is by his permission alone that they deliberately seal their hearts and ears with their sins and deviation from the truth. So we don't misunderstand the verses that Allah talks about sealing the hearts of the disbelievers and the corrupt. That he seals their hearts and ears to mean that in spite of their choice, meaning they could have wanted otherwise but Allah sealed their hearts and they have no chance because then the issue of judgment and punishment becomes meaningless. So the sealing is taking place from their own actions. But Allah refers to it as His sealing because it only takes place by His permission. Meaning if He didn't want them to seal their hearts, they couldn't. If He wished them all to be guided, they would have been. As Allah said in Surah Al-Anfal, Had Allah known any good in them, He would surely have made them hear. And even if he had made them here, they would have turned away with aversion. And also in Surah Ra'd, he said, لَوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ لَهَدَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا If Allah wished, he would have guided all the people. So their misguidance is not, we don't take from that, that Allah wishes for them misguidance. Because one could say that's the opposite, that's the corollary of what he's saying here. If Allah wished, He would have guided all the people. Instead, He wished to misguide the people. No. That, you don't take that meaning. Had He wished, He would have guided or could have guided all of them. But those who choose not to be guided, He permits them to be misguided. This is the correct understanding. Because sometimes people get confused on this thinking that we are believers and guided just by luck, I could say. You know? Allah looked into his creatures and said, I like him, so I'll guide him. When he looked into his creatures, he saw somebody else he didn't like, said, I won't guide him. So it's just like your good luck or your bad luck. No, this is not the way guidance comes. Guidance is a consequence of our own actions. Allah puts the clarity, the furqan inside each and every one of our hearts to know the truth and to recognize corruption. So those who, when truth comes to them, they accept it and they continue to accept it. Allah gives them guidance, adds to the guidance. Those who reject, turn away constantly, then they are the ones through their rejection who seal their own hearts. But even that sealing of the hearts cannot take place without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Following that, the next chapter, Ibn Taymiyyah, looks at the right of the heart. If it is the right of the heart to know truth, as we talked about before, that the, the heart is, its uh, job is to know and to understand. Not merely to hear, to recognize, but to internalize and to reflect on and to guide the rest of the body parts in acting in accordance with, we talked about uh, the having the internal understanding similar to the external actions that they should match. Right? So Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, if it is the right of the heart to know truth, Allah is the ultimate truth. That is Allah, your Lord, the truth. So what is there beyond the truth but misguidance? فَذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمُ الْحَقِّ فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ Allah is the Lord, author, creator and beginner of every fleeting thought which occurs in the brain or crosses the mind. 
Whatever knowledge the heart comprehends is among the clear signs of Allah in his earth and his sky. The most truthful words said by a poet is that of Labid. Allah kullu shay'in ma khalallahi batilu. Indeed, everything else besides Allah is false. Human discoveries are actually revelations from Allah. Whatever true knowledge human beings learn is what Allah has shown them and permitted them to learn. False knowledge, like the theory of evolution, is from Satan. Without, however, without Allah's permission, even that cannot be learned. Right? Whatever knowledge the heart comprehends is among the clear signs of Allah in his earth and his sky. Right? It is all ultimately from Allah. And the ultimate knowledge is that of Allah himself. Then Ibn Taymiyyah quotes the statement of a poet, Labid. Now Labid ibn Rabi'ah was a pagan when he recited this line of poetry. Allah kullu shay'in ma khalallahi batilu. Indeed everything else besides Allah is false. The people prior to the revelation were aware of Allah. Knowledge of Allah had trickled down to them from the time of Prophet Ismail and Prophet Abraham who built the Kaaba. Right? So that knowledge was available in the time of the Prophet Muhammad either as certain elements of specific knowledge which caused people like Waraqa Ibn Nawfal to go ahead and to convert to Christianity based on the knowledge that had trickled down and to recognize the revelation when Prophet Muhammad uh, brought it to him through his wife Khadija right so this shows that those people were not without any knowledge at all and this is why you have a number of narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu in which he did speak about some people of that time as going to hell you know and some people objected saying how can you say that when there was no prophet at the time you know and this becomes the same issue concerning the prophet's father and mother right where he made reference to them in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari as being in hell you know and this is something very objectionable to many Muslims they don't accept it because even the Prophet's house in Mecca they claim is the house of his father in Mecca people go there and they pray there make special rakat there believing that there's a special reward barakah from praying in this house when of course we don't even know whether it was the Prophet's house and in fact, as the Prophet ﷺ had said about his own father, when a man came and asked him, where is my father? He said, in the fire. And when the man turned away in tears, Prophet ﷺ called him back and said, he is with my father. You know? So there's no uncertainty about this fact. And the same thing was in the case of his mother. You know? Uh, so people objected to that because they said, they, you know, prophethood hadn't come. So how can we say they're in the hellfire? Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said they're in the hellfire. And how can they be in the hellfire when the message didn't come? We say the fact that the Prophet ﷺ said they're in the hellfire means that the message reached them. Because Allah said in the Quran, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رسولا. We would not punish anyone until a messenger has come to them. So if the message didn't reach them, there is no punishment. One cannot say they're in hell. So for the Prophet ﷺ to say that about them and about others, he spoke about others, saying that they're in hell also. It is because through revelation he knew that the message reached them. Anyway, Labid later accepted Islam and is considered among the companions of the Prophet. ﷺ. When Omar ibn al Khattab asked him about his poetry uh, that he composed after accepting Islam, he replied, Surah al Baqarah has replaced my poetry. He settled in Kufa and died there during the Caliphate of, Umar, of Uthman ibn Affan at the age of 150. Umar ibn al-Khattab used to encourage the narration of Labid's ode containing the verses, Indeed fear of our Lord is the best booty, 
By Allah's permission is my taking time and haste. I praise Allah for he has no equal. All good is in his hand and whatever he wishes he does. Whoever he guides to the path of good is guided and at ease and whoever he wishes he misguides. You know, this was from his poetry, pre-Islamic poetry. You know, so uh, Omar ibn al-Khattab used to encourage the recitation of this poetry. Now, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he quoted the text of a hadith to illustrate this, his point that Allah is the ultimate truth that needs to be known above all else. Uh, when he said oh, the hadith from Abu Huraira saying the most truthful words because this statement he said the most truthful words by a poet is that of Labid actually it comes in the text of what he wrote but it's actually taken from a hadith he doesn't mention it as a hadith but it's a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim in which Abu Huraira quoted the Prophet as saying the most truthful word spoken by a poet was the word of Labid indeed everything else besides Allah is false and then he went on to say Umayyah ibn Abi Salt almost accepted Islam uh, right he made reference here uh, to Umayyah ibn Abi Salt you know as a, a poet of Jahiliya who whose poetry was similar to that of Labid and through looking at the poetry he said he almost accepted Islam but he didn't in the case of Labid anyway uh, the second line of the poetry that Labid had said وَكُلُّ نَعِيمٍ لَا مَحَالَ تَزَائِلُ And every pleasure without exception will end. That's the second uh, line of the couplet. Actually in Mecca when the Quraysh were at their worst in inflicting suffering on Muslims, Uthman ibn uh, Mad'un had just returned from the first hijrah to Abyssinia and entered Mecca under the protection of Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira. When he saw the extent to which the pagans were harming Muslims and he remained safe, he relieved Al-Walid from his protection. While he was in a gathering of Qurayshite leaders, Labid came to them, sat down and began to recite some of his poetry. When Labid recited, indeed everything else besides Allah is false, Uthman ibn Mad'un said, you have spoken the truth. But when he recited the second half, saying, And every pleasure without exception will end, Uthman said, You have lied. The pleasures of paradise do not end. Labid then said, Since to the Quraishite leaders, Since when do you harm those who sit with you, O people of Quraysh? And a man got up immediately, because their honor had been wounded, and slapped Uthman, and his eye became green. Al-Walid then chided him for relinquishing his protection, saying, You are in my protection. Uh, Uthman replied, My other eye is in need of what befell the first. Al-Walid told him, Come back to my protection. He replied, I re rather prefer the protection of Allah Most High. Now, Ibn Hajr actually explained that if the term batil in this phrase uh, is taken to mean that which will perish then the pleasures of paradise are included and everything besides Allah can perish even if Allah creates for its eternity afterwards right so actually if we look at what uh, Labid said from another perspective it is true even the second half of the poetry because only Allah is without end Ibn Taymi went on to explain that is everything looked at from the perspective of itself is headed towards non-existence and in need of the ever-living, the eternal. If you looked at anything 
which the hand of care has taken charge of according to the destiny of he who gave everything its form and then guided it you would see it existing and clothed with garments of grace and kindness all things besides the law were brought into existence from a state of non-existence by a law and they're all headed back to that state Ibn Taymiyyah included a portion of a verse in his explanation of Allah's mercy manifest in his creation and guidance of human beings the verse is he said our Lord is he who gave everything its form then guided it it's in Surah Taha verse 50 and when he said you would see it existing and clothed with garments of grace and kindness if we looked at everything with regards to its destiny here the favors which Allah has granted human beings are countless as Allah himself says if you were to count Allah's blessings you would not be able to calculate them this is found in two places in the Quran Surah Ibrahim verse 34 and Surah Nahal verse 18 Allah's favors not only cover this world but also the next as no one will enter paradise merely because of his or her deeds in a hadith narrated by Aisha she said that the Prophet ﷺ said observe moderation but if you fail try to do as much as you can moderately and be happy for none will enter paradise only because of his deeds the companions asked O Messenger of Allah not even you he replied not even I were it not that Allah enveloped me in his mercy grace and forgiveness and bear in mind that the deed most loved by Allah is one done constantly even though it is small so the Prophet ﷺ stressed that even in the entering into paradise this is by the grace of Allah now of course there are verses in the Quran where Allah talks about people being in paradise because of the deeds that they did so this might seem to contradict the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, but it actually doesn't when the Prophet ﷺ said that it is by the grace of Allah this doesn't negate the deeds of human beings he said they will not enter purely because of their deeds but it doesn't negate that the deeds has a role meaning that it is by Allah's grace that he rewards a good deed ten times over and more whereas the evil deed is only kept equal to one so if Allah were to keep good deeds as one reward and evil deeds as one evil deed then no one would enter paradise so it is by the grace of Allah that he multiplies good and as he said in Al-Hasanat Yudhibn Sayyat that good deeds erase evil deeds so it is by Allah's mercy and grace that we are able to erase evil deeds and if Allah has uh, given us the tawfiq we would enter paradise as a result of his grace Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say it then becomes clear that the heart was only created for the remembrance of Allah may he be glorified the heart was only created for the remembrance of Allah As he said in the very beginning he said it's the right of the heart to know the truth and Allah is the ultimate truth so if it is that right to know Allah it is we're talking about what the remembrance of Allah that we should be conscious of Allah that Allah should be in our hearts and the importance of remembrance of Allah and knowledge can be found in a hadith narrated by Abu Huraira and is authentic in which Abu Huraira said indeed this world and its contents are cursed Allah inna dunya mal'una mal'unun ma fiha except the remembrance of Allah and what helps to remember Allah the scholar and the student illa dhikrullah wa ma wala wa alimun wa muta'allimun the 
this is how important the remembrance of Allah is. The Prophet ﷺ also said, Shall I inform you of the best of your deeds? The one that raises you most in rank, most purifying in the sight of Allah, which is better for you than giving gold and silver, and better for you than meeting your enemy and striking their necks and them striking your necks. They said, certainly, tell us. He said, it is the remembrance of Allah the Exalted. It is remembrance of Allah the Exalted. The Prophet ﷺ puts the remembrance of Allah above everything. Above everything that we know as among the greatest of deeds. Jihad, martyrdom, fi sabilillah, zakah, giving in charity, giving of our wealth. Remembrance of Allah. Of course, Allah stressed that saying, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatmain al qulub. It is only with the remembrance of Allah that hearts find rest. Ultimately, rest in this life and in the next. So obviously, that is something everybody seeks. Everybody wants what we call peace of mind. Every human being strives for it in one way or another. Whether he strives for it in the pleasures of this world, thinking that in attaining them he will get satisfaction. Satisfaction being peace of mind. But it's not. As the Prophet ﷺ said, if the child of Adam were given one valley of gold, he would desire another. This is the nature of human beings. And they say the grass is always greener on the other side. You know, we're never satisfied. The more you have, the more you want. So there is no satisfaction and uh, peace of mind and heart except ultimately in the remembrance of Allah. And of course when we speak about the remembrance of Allah, we're talking about all of the aspects. We're not talking as some people mistakenly think that it's only referring to repeating names of Allah over and over again. And of course, actually, from the Sunnah, you will not find any form of remembrance in any authentic narration in which the Prophet ﷺ said to repeat a name of Allah over and over again. Though it is the common understanding of people today. In fact, we even have books on the 99 names of Allah in which you're told to say this name of Allah so many times and this is going to happen for you. Your wife can't have a baby, she says this name so many times, she'll get a baby. Your business is failing. You say that name so many times, you'll get success. You know, these are the great promises in these books. And of course, these books should be burnt. Because they're lies. They're falsehood. It's not found in any authentic hadith. Whenever the Prophet ﷺ told us to make dhikr of Allah, he gave us phrases, statements. Subhanallah, glorified be to Allah. La ilaha illallah. These are statements which have meaning. Not a word repeated over and over and over again. Even common sense tells us that this is, doesn't, this is not logical, it's not reasonable. Somebody wants to call on you. They want to ask you for help to do something for them. But they just keep re repeating your name over and over again. Muhammad, 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 Muhammad. You're going to say this person has lost his mind. You know, what is it you want? You know, repeating my name is not going to achieve anything. Right? So if we can understand that in, in common terms in our own lives, then surely it must be obvious to us with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why, as I said, when we look in the sunnah, we will not find that. We'll only find the Prophet sallam telling us to make meaningful statements. Taymiyyah went on to say, as a result of that, a Syrian sage of the past, I believe it was Suleiman al-Khawas, may Allah have mercy on him, said, Remembrance of God in relationship to the heart is like nourishment 
relative to the body. Thus, as the body cannot find pleasure in food when it is sick, likewise the heart cannot find sweetness of remembrance of Allah, God, when it is in love with the material world or something to that effect. Remembrance of God in relationship to the heart is like nourishment relative to the body. Thus, as the body cannot find pleasure in food when it is sick, likewise the heart cannot find the sweetness of remembrance of God when it is in love with the material world. This is not a hadith. This is a statement Ibn Taymiyyah believes is attributable to Sulaiman al-Khawas. Sulaiman al-Khawas was among the leading aesthetics of Syria and a contemporary of Ibrahim ibn Adham. He used to attend the classes of Imam al-Awza'i in Lebanon. On one occasion, Saeed ibn Abdul Aziz attended a class of al-Awza'is in which he mentioned the aesthetics and said, we need to be like these people. Aesthetics meaning the people who are focused on remembering of Allah, living simple lives, etc., etc., you know, but staying within the bounds of the Sharia. So he said, we need to be like these people. Without realizing that, Sulaiman al-Khawas was present. Sa'id, this person who narrated it, Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz, he commented about Sulaiman ibn al-Khawas and saying, I have not seen anyone more aesthetic than Sulaiman al-Khawas. At this point, when Sulaiman was sitting there in the gathering, heard him say that, he covered his face with his turban, got up and left. Right. al awzai then went to Sa'id and said, Woe be on you! Do you think, do you think about what comes out of your head? You have learned, you have harmed one of the attendees by praising him to his face. Said later visited Suleiman in his house in Beirut at night and found him in darkness. When he asked him why, Suleiman replied that the grave would be darker. When Saeed asked him why he was alone in the house without any companion, he replied he disliked having a companion who he was unable to serve, meaning he didn't have enough money. So he would not like to bring people in his house, he couldn't do anything for them. So Saeed offered him some dirhams, but he refused, saying that whatever little he had was a result of great effort, and he disliked making himself get used to easy money. Anyway, with the statement of Suleiman, remembrance of Allah in relationship to the heart is like remembrance, is like nourishment relative to the body. Which type of remembrance is true nourishment to, for the heart? People think of dhikr or remembrance in the narrow sense repeating certain prescribed statements of remembrance. However, dhikr is in fact the heart's remembrance and consciousness of Allah which should accompany every believer's actions and statements. Sa'id ibn Jubair said, dhikr is obedience to Allah. Dhikr is obedience to Allah. Whoever obeys Allah has in fact remembered him. Whoever does not obey him is not one who remembers him. Even if he says tasbih, subhanallah, and recites the book a lot. Ibn Taymiyyah also stated in his Majmur and Fatawa, every statement made by the tongue and conceived by the heart, which takes one closer to Allah, including learning knowledge, teaching it, commanding the good and forbidding evil, is a form of dhikr of Allah. This mindfulness of Allah is the nourishment of the heart. While the formal form of dhikr wherein a person remembers Allah with specific words at specific times as defined by the sunnah aids and develops the true remembrance of the heart. Furthermore, since dhikr is the nourishment of the heart, a heart which lacks it is dead. Hence the Prophet ﷺ said, the similitude of one who remembers his Lord and one who does not remember his Lord is like the similitude of death and life. Dhikr is the obedience to Allah. 
Whoever obeys Allah has in fact remembered him. Whoever does not obey him is not one who remembers him. Even if he says Subhanallah and recites the Quran often. This is a thought which is worth reflecting on. And inshallah I will stop at this point and give you a chance to ask any questions uh, that you have regarding what we have taken so far. The hadith? No, it wasn't a hadith, but it's asking about uh, what took place with Labid Ibn Rabi'ah. He had said the first part of that line of poetry, indeed everything else besides Allah is false. When he said that, Uthman, who was one of the companions of the Prophet, not Uthman ibn Affan, another companion, who had returned from Abyssinia, they had made the hijrah there, he came back early, and he was in Mecca. When he found that Muslims were suffering to such a degree that they were, he relieved the person who had acted as his guardian from responsibility and said he wanted to suffer as they did. He didn't want to make a special case for himself. So when Labid had recited this line of poetry, he said, you spoke the truth. But when he said the conclusion from it, the, clu- the second half of the poetry, uh, which was, uh, what is it now? And everything besides, uh, what's it called? And every pleasure is will perish or will disappear. Uh, This is uh, Osman then stated that this was false, that you've lied. Why? He was basing it on the fact that paradise is eternal. Assalamu alaikum. one question okay okay the reference from for the verse which was asked and I would not punish anyone until a messenger was sent this is found in Surah Al-Isra right in the beginning uh, 10 or 15 verses the brother's question weren't the parents of the Prophet amongst the Hunafa? No. We don't have any reference to that effect. And most of the fables which were made up about the Prophet's mother and father, which we find in many books of Sirah, you know. Most of them are false. You know, there's very little in terms of the birth of the Prophet you know, which uh, the so-called miracles that people talk about, which are true. Most of it is untrue. And this is just mainly an attempt on the part of Muslims, you know, considering that at the time of the birth of Isa, alayhi salam, you have all these stories about the star and the wise men following the star and they say, well, if that happened to Prophet Isa, something should have happened to Prophet Muhammad So, they started making up stories. And they didn't stop there. And the saints and all these kind of individuals, you have all kinds of stories they've made up about them. People like Abdul Qadir al-Jilani and others, you'll find some fantabulous stories about what happened with them. And of course, the Shia are not to be outdone in this matter. When you read about Ali, you read stuff like, there's one narration that they have in one book called Fatima is Fatima, that um, when Ali was in the stomach of his mother, they could hear him reciting Quran. This is before he was born. He was reciting Quran in the stomach of his mother. Prophet didn't receive prophethood yet. Quran hadn't descended on him and, recite, and Ali is reciting it in his stomach as, a, as an embryo. <laughs> 
So, uh, unfortunately, the main body of Muslims have fallen into a portion of that. And uh, those stories, it's good to have them checked out to find out what is authentic amongst them. Sorry, I've got a second part of the same question. Will he not be able on the day of Yom Al-Qiyamah to make Shafa'ah for his parents? Will the Prophet not be able on the day of Qiyamah to make Shafa'ah for his parents? No. If he is not able to make Shafa'ah for Abu Talib, right, to get him out of the hellfire, he is able to make Shafa'ah to lighten his punishment, right, because of the good he did, etc to lighten his punishment. But to get him out of the hellfire, he cannot. Even to lighten the punishment of his parents? Well, if he had Shafa to lighten the punishment of his parents, he would have told us. Right? He would have told us. And him not telling us informs us that there is no lightening. And if we consider the father of Prophet Abraham, right? who Prophet Abraham sought forgiveness for him but there is none right? that he would be in the hellfire forever no lightning of any punishment for him then it should not be a problem for us accepting the same for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's parents Assalamualaikum Additional reference in Sunan uh, or Sahih Muslim, when the, the Prophet ﷺ talked about uh, going to the graves, right? And he said, I used to forbid you from going to the graves. Now go and visit them because they are most, uh, they are best to remind you of the hereafter. In some of the narration, he mentions that he asked Allah's permission to visit the graves, right? And he was given permission. And then he asked Allah's permission to ask forgiveness for his mother at her grave, and he wasn't given permission. You know, that further puts him in the same category as Prophet Abraham with his own parents. Brother's question, uh, which we looked at earlier, I think you haven't been here with us, Allah, right? But why is it that in most languages, the process of thinking and reasoning and feeling is related to the heart, even though in modern science we know, or we think we know, that it is from the mind. Now we dealt with the issue, okay, you weren't here, so we... You know, we had discussed this at length previously, you know, uh, that even our so-called knowledge, thinking that it is from the mind, is, is questionable. Yes, it may appear to us that when certain parts of the brain is damaged, our thinking processes are affected. So we say then our mind must be in our brain. But that is not necessarily so, as we talked about uh, the case of acupuncture, you know, where you have a pain in your brain and they stick a, a, a needle in your toe and the pain goes away. Can we say that that pain in you that you thought was in your brain was actually in your toe? No, nobody says that. We accept that there is somehow a connection between your toe and your, br and your head and that uh, Sticking the pin in the toe does affect that part of your brain or whatever. So the fact that uh, the brain is connected in the process of thinking doesn't exclude the heart 
or the location of the heart from being the origin right that it takes place through these other bodily part the body organs we already pointed out that we know that it isn't the actual organ itself because we have replaced hearts with artificial hearts and people have lived with them right so the heart still refers to the core of the individual the place where the heart is placed is the heart so that perhaps Allah knows best is the point at which the soul is related to the human body and that is and as such the reference is made to it you know but it's found in most languages the heart is referred to as the place of feeling and thought Well, our brother is raising the question that surely the punishment due to the parents of the Prophet Sallallahu who lived before his prophethood shouldn't be like the punishment for those who came afterwards, who heard the message. Surely, you know, there must be excused or some sort of whatever. Well, we know that people who are in between the period of the prophet, they're called the people of the interval. Al-Fatra that these people according to authentic narrations from the Prophet ﷺ, will be brought back and given a second chance anybody who did not receive the message it didn't come to them they will be given a second chance prior to the actual judgment they will be brought back and Allah will send a messenger to them who will explain about Allah etc and then give them a command to enter what appears to them to be fire and those who enter it will go on to paradise those who refuse will go on to hell this is a number of narrations to that effect it's authentic right but these are those who did not receive the message due to the fact that they were deaf dumb and blind they were retarded they died as children they were in far off places where the message just never got these people are in that category but of the people who are prior to the, the the prophethood there were some of them who the message did reach and those who the message reached but continued to practice idolatry then they are confirmed by the Prophet ﷺ through revelation as being in hell and obviously his parents were among them it's not everybody of that period, some of them. There are specific people, one time Prophet ﷺ passed by a grave. He was riding on a horse or animal, and the animal reared up, almost knocked him off. You know, and he was wondering, what caused this? And he saw that there were some graves over in the distance, and he asked, whose graves were these? And he said, these are the graves of some people who died in the pre-Islamic times. He said that they are being punished, punished right now in their graves. You know, punishment, meaning that there are people going to hell. Because if you receive the punishment of the grave, means you're going to hell. That's the beginning of your hell. You know? So, he spoke of those three in that way. Because, obviously from Revelation, they were among those who had received the message. In a sufficiently understandable form to distinguish between truth and falsehood. Stop here, Subhanakallah, and we have the shadow of the land. Stop Firuka, one or two will I just like to mention uh, that we will be carrying on uh, during Ramadan. I will uh, get some actual timings for you. Uh, maybe next week, inshallah, we have the set timings, we'll inform you. Uh, also, a collection of my books have arrived from the Emirates. There's about uh, 25 new books. They're available in the women's side as well as the men's side. You can see them in the case downstairs before you leave. You can pass after Salah if you wish to get copies. You may be able to get them, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa
Bismillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. This is just a test to make sure that the sound is okay from the women's side. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulil kareem, wa ala ali wa ashabi, wa man istanna bi sunnati lewa middeen. All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. In the previous session, we looked at the chapter Right of the Heart and that is page 10 in your books, The Right of the Heart. And that chapter focused on the basic principle that it is the right of the heart to know the truth. And that the ultimate truth is Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the ultimate truth. He describes himself as being al-haq in the verse فَذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمُ الْحَقُ that is Allah your Lord the truth he is the embodiment of truth everything that comes from him is truth and uh, we went on to look at the implication of that statement if Allah is the ultimate truth and it is the right of the heart to know the truth, then we concluded, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, that the heart was created fundamentally for the remembrance of Allah. That was the conclusion that we ended up with. And he quoted a statement of one of the aesthetics of the past, Suleiman al khawas who was reported to have said, remembrance of God in relationship to the heart is like nourishment relative to the body. Thus, as the body cannot find pleasure in food when it is sick, likewise the heart cannot find sweetness of remembrance of God when it is in love with the material world. And we discussed briefly about remembrance, what is intended here by the remembrance of Allah, pointing out that it is not just the ritual act of repeating uh, praises of Allah. And we said that just repeating Allah's name over and over again was not from the Sunnah. In fact, it is a form of bid'ah. And we mentioned the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ found in Bukhari and Muslim in which the Prophet ﷺ had said the similitude of one who remembers his Lord and one who does not remember his Lord is like the similitude of death and life. Now, as a further note, when one is attached to this world, its pleasures and pursuits. This attachment occupies a great portion of the heart, which was created to be attached to Allah. Hence, it distracts the person from higher goals of attaining closeness to Allah, righteousness and paradise. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said in Surah Al-Munafiqoon verse 9, Ya ayuhal ladina amanu, لا تلهكم أموالكم ولا أولادكم عن ذكر الله ومن يفعل ذلك فأولئك هم الخاسرون O you who believe, do not let your riches or your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah and those who do so will be the losers This is what Allah is referring to the where we become so attached to the material things of this world, whether it's our wealth, our children, right? These are among the major things which tend to distract people. That that state where we are attached to it prevents us from the higher goals 
we get caught up in the day-to-day -day, uh, needs of fulfilling the needs of family, uh, earning money. Uh, it's natural, we have to do these things. But where it becomes the focus of our lives, then the higher goal, the higher purpose of creation, which was to worship Allah, becomes lost. And the remembrance of Allah becomes difficult because we are tied up in fulfilling the basic material needs. And this is also alluded to in the verses 1 to 2 of Surah Takathur, al hakum al takathur hatta zurtum al-maqabir. The mutual competition for compiling the good things of this world diverts you from more serious things until you visit the graves. Now this is the time when people wake up, but of course then it is too late. So though Muslims are certain of the fact that the world will perish, most of them have not internalized this reality and its implication in their hearts. They are instead preoccupied with the worldly desires and goals, not realizing the insignificance of this world. The Prophet ﷺ once passed by a dead goat, which had either very small ears or mutilated ears. And the Prophet ﷺ picked it up and asked his companions, which of you would like to have this for a dirham? They said, we don't want it. What would we use it for? He said, would you like to have it for free? They replied, by Allah, even if it were alive, we, wouldn't find, we would find it defective. So, why would we even want it now that it is dead? The Messenger of Allah then said to them, by Allah, the world is more insignificant to Allah than this dead goat is to you. The world is even more insignificant to Allah than this dead goat is to you. Meaning that the, we should treat the world, we should look at the world in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, looks at it and that is something like the way we would look at a rotting carcass of a dead goat on the road. Something which had a purpose, but not something you would want to take home and cuddle up with, keep as a part of your, you know, part in your house, give it a place, etc. No, this is something, it just had a use, it was useful for a time and you leave it, you keep going by it, it's rotten. And this also is a reflection of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the well-known statement that we should be in this world like a stranger or a traveler. To be in this world like a stranger or a traveler. Not becoming so attached to it that we lose sight of the journey. What the real goal of that journey is, we've lost sight of. We've got caught up on the way. Yeah. And there is a well-known hadith regarding the dunya in which the Prophet ﷺ had said, and this is one uh, is very good for us to reflect on uh, often. Whoever makes this world their main goal, then Allah will scatter his affairs and make poverty between his eyes. And nothing will come to him of this world except what was written for him. Whoever makes this world his or her main goal is the focus. Allah will scatter their affairs, meaning they will be busy with this and busy with that and here, there, everywhere, you know, nothing will come together. It will all be, they will be just too busy. Nothing is complete. You can't complete this. You have something else to do on this, you know. This will be your state. When you make this world your goal. And nothing will come to us in spite of all of this effort trying to get a hold of this and that and everything. But nothing will come to us except what was already written for us. All that hurrying and scurrying and running around, etc. is not going to bring us any more. What was already written is all that is coming anyway. On the other hand, whoever makes the hereafter his goal or her goal, Allah will gather their affairs for them. 
Allah will put it all together. Everything will be in place. You will not be distracted by so many things running here trying to grab everything. It will be clear. The path will be clear. It will be settled. Our hearts, our minds will be settled. And He will place in their heart richness. They will feel a sense of richness of heart. Contentment. This is the ultimate richness. And the world will come to him conquered and submissive. When the world is ignored, it will come on its knees begging us. This is the promise of the Prophet But, of course, the lure of the world is so great, in spite of that promise and in spite of our claimed belief in Rasulullah we will remain in that first category. Instead of being in the second category, who make the hereafter their goal, for whom Allah will bring together all of their affairs, and Allah will put richness in their hearts, and the world will come to them. They will be saying, no, I don't want, you know. This is something worth reflecting on and striving for. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, If the heart is busy with the remembrance of Allah, aware of the truth, and reflecting on knowledge, it is in its correct location. Or we could say it is correctly situated. Just as the eye when used to look at things is in its correct location. Meaning it is being utilized for what it was intended to be utilized for. On the other hand, if it is not used for knowledge and it is unaware of the truth, it forgets its Lord and is not in its location. Rather, it is lost. As a result, the limbs on the Day of Judgment will bear witness against him. The limbs will bear witness against him. As Allah said, Surah Fussilat, their ears, their eyes, and their skins will testify against them about what they did. So, it is not necessary, Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, for me to say that it was not put in its correct location, as it was not put anywhere at all. Certainly, its correct location is the truth, and everything besides the truth is false. And this is a phrase which is commonly used in the Quran, which he has worked into his presentation. In the Quran, we can find it in Surah Yunus, verse 32. فَذَٰلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمُ الْحَقِّ فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ That is your Lord, the truth, Allah. And what is there after truth except error? So if the heart is not remembering Allah, then it is caught up in falsehood. There are different levels of falsehood, of course. There's falsehood which is evil, deliberate sin, and then there's falsehood which is just neglect, negligence. The ultimate strive of the human being should be to be conscious of Allah at all times. Conscious of Allah at all times meaning that we, in whatever we do, which may not be in itself ibadah, we are doing what is pleasing to Allah. So by consciously making sure that what we do is something pleasing to Allah or not displeasing to Allah, then we have remembered Allah without actually mentioning His name or uh, making a statement of praise of Allah, etc. So, the remembrance of Allah can come in a variety of different forms. We don't necessarily have to be just making dhikr all of the time. Right? Because we do have this world, we do have something to do in this world. 
But the point is that we remember Allah in the world by doing what is pleasing to Him. By consciously choosing to do what is pleasing to Him over what is displeasing to Him. Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, Therefore, if it is not located in the truth, there is nothing left for it but falsehood. Furthermore, falsehood is not fundamentally a thing, and what is not a thing is not suitable as a location. Now, in this statement, Ibn Taymiyyah introduces a philosophical concept which is too deep for us to go into here because to go into it would be to sidetrack, you know, in a major way. But I'll give you just an idea what he was speaking about. When he said, falsehood is not fundamentally a thing. A thing. Why? Why did he even mention this? Get into falsehood is not fundamentally a thing. Because we have the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a number of verses in the Quran, but we can see it in Surah Az Zumar, verse 32. Allahu khaliku kulli shay. Allah is the creator of everything. So, when he mentioned about falsehood, that that is what is left, if a person is not in truth, then they're in falsehood. He's saying, falsehood is not fundamentally a thing, meaning it is not from the creation of Allah. Falsehood is not from the creation of Allah. He's entering into the concept of Allah being the creator of everything. Is evil, corruption, all of these falsehood, is that from the things of Allah's creation? If Allah is good and whatever he does is good, then where do we place falsehood, corruption, evil, etc.? Right? And this is a point which for some people becomes a point for disbelief, for them to fall into atheism. It's a part of the argument of the atheists. That if Allah is good, and He is all-powerful, then where did the evil come from? If, unless you say that Allah created evil. And of course, you know, as a believer, it's difficult for you to just say like this. In fact, we have a hadith which was narrated by Ali ibn Abi Talib regarding the attribution of evil to Allah. And this was part of the opening supplication of the Tahajjid prayer and it's found in Sahih Muslim in which uh, Prophet had said لَبَّيْكَ وَسَعَدَيْكَ وَالْخَيْرُ كُلُّهُ فِي يَدَيْكَ وَالشَّرُّ لَيْسَ إِلَيْكَ I hear your call and I'm following your religion and all good is in your two hands and evil is not attributable to you and evil is not attributable to you. And we see where Allah says in the uh, second last chapter of the Quran, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq min sharri ma khalaq. I seek refuge in the Lord of the dawn from the evil of what he created. He doesn't say the evil he created. You can see there's a deliberate uh, <coughs> buffer zone which is put between the evil and Allah's creation, right? So it is a product of his creation, not himself creating evil because of the implication what is involved there. However, as uh, scholars pointed out, that evil is of two types. Falsehood, evil is of two types. Non-existent evil and existent evil. Meaning, non-existent evil meaning the absence of good in that vacuum is evil. When you remove good from something, what remains in that vacuum is evil. Now that is an absence, a lack of, non-existence. So when you talk about creation, it doesn't include non-existence. Creation, when you talk about Allah created 
everything, you mean every existing thing. So this is the aspect of evil which is not attributable to Allah. The non-existence of good. But now, as a consequence of that non-existence, evil acts may take place. Right? That aspect of evil is from Allah's creation. Because nothing can take place without His permission. Nothing can take place without His permission. Now regarding that aspect which does take place, Ibn al-Qayyim had said, the second form of evil, existing evil like false beliefs, corrupt desires, it is, ne it is a necessary consequence of the non-existence of good, the, fir the early, the first form of evil. For whenever beneficial knowledge and righteous deeds from a soul are absent, they are automatically followed by evil and ignorance and what they necessitate. This must be the case because the soul must be in one of two opposite states. If it is not busy with beneficial and righteous deeds, it will be busy doing harmful and corrupt deeds. This existing evil is from the creation of the Almighty. As there is no creator besides Him, and He is the creator of everything, because this is the thing. Yeah? However, there must be a good purpose for everything that Allah the Almighty created. If He did not create it, that good purpose would be lost and it is not wise to let that good purpose pass which is more beloved to him may he be glorified than the resulting good in its non-existence okay so this is the point we mention here that the evil which is existing evil is from Allah's creation and like Satan, calamities and all the other things that we refer to as evil things, this is all from Allah's creation. But Allah created it for the good which comes from it, or the good aspect of it, and not for the evil that we observe and we perceive, we experience. And I think I touched on that earlier as I come to remember, and uh, gave you some examples of it. Did I not? No? Okay. Well, the example that can easily be given with regards to children, that if you take the children, you tell your child, we now have to go to the dentist. They've been to the dentist before. What does the child say? Ahlan wa sahlan. Let's go to the dentist. No, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to go to the dentist. Why? Because all the child can perceive from going to the dentist is pain, right? That is the sum total of the visit to the dentist. No matter how many candies the dentist gives the kid afterwards, you know, how many toys you buy them afterwards, still the main perception of the child for the dentist is pain. Right? Now you know, because you're not taking your child to the dentist for the pain. You're taking the child to the dentist so the child so the child will be saved from greater pain right which is of rotting teeth and the pain that comes with it so by the dentist cleaning the teeth full filling it and all these things though it involves pain it's to prevent a greater pain we know it but you can't convince the child right? because his or her limited scope they can only focus on the pain and that's the same with us with the calamities of our lives. Calamities strike, and all we can see is the calamity. We have difficulty in grasping that there is a good behind it. Very, we can hardly. Somebody tries to tell you, don't, you know, there is good. Maybe you can't see it now, but for sure, if Allah has permitted this to happen to you, there is good in it. And this was the essence of the story of Musa and Khidr. That's what the story that we read on Fridays is about, isn't it? You know, that was the lesson. Musa 
is following Khidr, learning from Khidr. Khidr tells him, don't ask me about what I do until I tell you. Musa says, okay, no problem, I'll be patient and I'll wait. But of course, everything that Khidr does, it goes against what Musa knows of the Sharia, so he has to speak out. You know, this is natural. He sees the man breaking the boat of those who gave him a ride. They gave them, a, you know, were provided a service and they returned the service by breaking his boat. What is this? You know? Then he, after that, when he tells, he reminds him, he says, okay, okay, I'll be patient, I forgot. Then the next thing, he jumps to a higher level. He finds a little boy, rips off his head. <laughs> Musa is aghast. You know, what are you doing? This child has not done anything. An innocent child, you're killing the child. And then, after he realizes, you know, he's been pushed right to the limit, he says, okay, okay, after that, if I question you again, you have the right to uh, depart, you know, part ways from me. So he goes to something very simple, which was people goes into a town, the people are very, very, you know, bad. They treated them very badly, wouldn't offer them any kind of, you know, uh, food or, you know, any kind of generosity or showing any kind of friendliness. Even when they asked them, they refused food. So on their way out, they come across a wall. So Khidr rebuilds it. It was falling down. Musa questions this. <laughs> better we'd have taken some reward from these people, yeah? Isn't it better we make them pay for it rather than you just doing something for them after they're so mean and that was it. Very simple point. But he's questioning Khidr, even on the simple point, he broke his agreement. So then Khidr goes and explains to him what was behind the things. Of course, the case of the wall, is, there is no calamity, no evil, no apparent evil, except that people who treat you ill, for you to do nice things to them is to encourage them in their ill, you know, except from that perspective, right? But from the perspective of the boat, Khidr explained that there was a king coming down the river and snatching people's boats, right? Now, by him putting the hole in the boat, it was a damaged boat, so the king would leave it. So it saved the man's boat. But of course, at the time that he did it, Musa couldn't catch that, couldn't understand it. And the child, he ripped off his head. This child, his parents were righteous. And this child, Allah knew, would grow up and become such a trial to those parents it would almost drive them into disbelief. So to spare them from the evil of this child when he grows up, Allah had his life taken at that point and replaced him with another child. But for the parents, of course, they couldn't see this. Imagine somebody comes and murders your child. And of course, this was something special to Khidr, right? Huh? We don't have anybody else that can make this claim, right? Because this is your people who try to, you know, promote the idea that the Sheikh, the Peer, the Buzur or whatever, you know, he's like Khidr and you should be like Moses, Musa. You know, whatever he tells you, you just do. But no. You know, he was re receiving revelation. He said, I only did what Allah commanded me. That's why many scholars hold that Khidr was a prophet. Right? He was a prophet of Allah. He was under the commandment of Allah. He said, I only did this based on Allah's instructions. Right? So, the point is that, the point is that he uh, explained, even though he explained it to Musa, Musa could understand, for the parents of that child who lost their child in a brutal murder, I mean, what up here, you know, somebody rips off your child's head, that's pretty brutal. I mean, they're going to feel sad, even though Allah gave them another child, and this child, a girl, would grow up and be righteous and treat them well and everything, loving and all this, wonderful. But, still in their minds, they would think of that son who died at that early stage. But being righteous parents, of course, they would accept that it is Allah's other, right? But why? They wouldn't know. Of course, on the day of judgment, when all things become clear, then they will know that this was a mercy from Allah. Yaqeenan, certainly. Of course, 
as believers, uh, truly be, true believers, then we have to accept that every calamity which comes in our lives is a mercy from Allah. Though we have difficulty accepting it truly, you know, because when the pain of it comes, it's very difficult to see. You can't see, you know, to accept that there is good behind it anyway. So, this is the point that that form of evil, which is from the creation of Allah, is not for the evil that is in it, but for the good which comes from it. As we take the child to suffer pain at the hand of the dentist, we don't do it for the pain, but to prevent greater pain. That is the good which comes out of it. So, uh, this is the role of why we accept the idea that Allah has created even the evil things that are existing evils. This is from Allah's creation. They cannot take place without Allah's will. Then Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, the heart itself does not accept anything but the truth. So if what is contrary to the truth is put in it, the heart will not accept what, was, what it was not created for. That is the way of Allah. And you will never find change in Allah's way. That uh, statement at the end, of course, is a quotation from the verse which has occurred in a number of different places in the Quran. Sunnatullahi allati qad khalat min qablu wa lam tajila li sunnati Allahi tabdila. The sunnah of Allah which occurred before. And you will never find any change in the way of Allah. So, this statement of Ibn Taymiyyah, if we look at it on face value, the heart does not accept anything but the truth. So, what, so if what is put contrary, what is contrary to the truth is put in it, the heart will not accept what it was not created for. But we, the question is raised, don't people accept falsehood? Doesn't it go into their hearts in all of the different forms, whether it's music, it's falsehood, don't people, doesn't it go into their hearts, doesn't it become, you know, rooted in their hearts, or other forms of falsehood, corruption. Don't people take it in their hearts? What does Ibn Taymiyyah mean here when he says the heart does not accept anything but the truth? What he's referring to here is that the pure heart, the pure heart will not accept anything but the truth. The pure heart. The corrupted heart, of course, it will accept these things, corruption. But the pure heart will not accept anything but the truth. But even the corrupted heart, which is pure in its origin, though it may allow falsehood to enter, it doesn't really accept it. It doesn't really accept it. And this is why Prophet ﷺ had said, there's a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, narrated by an Nawas ibn Sam'an. Al-birru husnul khuluq. Righteousness is good character. Well, it's mumahaka fi nafsik wa karihta an yatali alayhi nas. And sin, or evil, corruption, is what is uh, uncomfortable in your soul, in yourself, within yourself. You feel uncomfortable about it. And you would dislike that people know about it. Know that you're thinking this, know that you plan to do it, or know that you did it, whatever category it is in, you feel uncomfortable in your heart. And of course, where, where the Prophet ﷺ said, and you displease that people would know about it. People here, uh, Ibn Daqiq al Eid, who gave, gave a commentary on the 40 hadith of Nawawi, he said that this refers to the prominent and exemplary personalities. Meaning, of course, people who are in corruption like yourself, maybe you tell them and they're happy and they'll laugh and enjoy. But no. Meaning, people who you respect, people who are prominent, righteous individuals, you would not like them to know about it.
So, as Ibn Taymiyyah mentions here, and there are other narrations uh, from the Sunnah, like the hadith of Wabisa, uh, Ibn Ma'bad, who said, I came to the, the Messenger of Allah, and he said, have you come to ask me about righteousness? And I said, yes. And he said, ask your heart. Istafti qalbak. Ask your heart. Al-birru matma'annat ilayhi nafs Righteousness is what the soul finds peace in. What the soul is calmed by. And the heart finds peace. Whereas sin is what scratches around in your soul. And you are in doubt about constantly thinking about. The doubt is there. Even if people give you fatwas. No matter what fatwas they give you, you know inside your heart this is not right. So for example, when Sheikh Al-Azhar last year made a fatwa which was published saying that taking riba from banks is permissible, for those people who are looking for it, they said Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Alhamdulillah, finally somebody became you know smart and used their Islamic knowledge properly right? <laughs> whereas for the mass of people who feared Allah they said there's no way if, no matter how great this person may be is Shaykh Al-Azhar he's been you know whatever he's set up there as the leading spokesman for religious scholars or religious you know decisions in the whole of Egypt and for a lot of Muslims throughout the world, Azhar represents the pinnacle of knowledge, regardless. Even though they don't know that he's not chosen because he was the most knowledgeable, the leading scholars got together and chose him to be Sheikh Al-Azhar. But no, he's appointed by the government. Right? <laughs> so this has nothing to do really with the depth of knowledge. This is just a political move. But for the average Muslim, he just here, Sheikh Al-Azhar. Right? So where the point is that for a Muslim who knows the basics of his religion, no matter who says this, it's not going to feel comfortable in his heart. And even if he was convinced by others, oh, Sheikh said, go ahead, don't worry about it, you have this problem, go to get the mortgage, get your house, whatever. Even if he does or she does go ahead and does it, they still feel inside their hearts, it's not right. It's really not right. So this is the nature. You know, and uh, Allah also uh, talked about the disbelievers saying biha anfusuhum, that they deny the truth deny the Quran deny the Prophet of Muhammad وسلم, deny even ex Allah's existence but their hearts are certain of it that's the truth the truth the heart knows it was created with that knowledge knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we talked about that before you know we will talk about it in more depth later so in spite of the fact that truth may or uh, falsehood may enter into the heart people may welcome it the fact of the matter is that the pure heart will not accept it and even their corrupted hearts our corrupted hearts we may accept to do certain evils but inside ourselves at the depth of our hearts we don't feel it's right so if we can never overcome that that is the pure heart there we can never overcome it it will never accept it it remains as our conscious telling us don't do it you really shouldn't have done it really it's not good so on so on so on and as we are coming to Ramadan it is worth reflecting on with regards to our hearts and Ramadan. As we're talking about the heart, 
and the importance of remembrance of Allah and putting knowledge in it and etc. The reality is that this plays a major role in success with Ramadan. Because if we look back at the past years, how many years have passed? How many Ramadans have passed? And we ask ourselves, have we improved? Has each Ramadan made us better people? Are we getting closer and closer to Allah? When the Prophet ﷺ said, Man sama Ramadan, iman and wahtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddam min dambi, whoever fasts Ramadan out of faith in Allah, belief in Allah, and seeking reward only from Allah, that Allah forgives his sins, his previous sins or her previous sins. And if our sins are forgiven, we will feel it. We will feel, have a sense of a removal of a burden. Like a person when he first comes into Islam, first accepts Islam, it's like a huge weight is lifted off him. And the Prophet ﷺ said it, that Islam yajubbu ma qabla. Islam wipes out what came before. And all the sin that was there is cancelled when the person becomes a Muslim. So when that sin is removed, as Allah said, it's forgiven of him. He will feel it. He will feel different. He will feel a different person. But we have to ask ourselves, have we felt different? Have we made all the ibadah in Ramadan, we've stayed up to hajjud and taraweeh and prayed and given and done all these different things. But after the Eid, we were back where we were. You know, as if all of that effort was for nothing. The next year comes around, we're back in the same position again. It's like we're just repeating the same action over and over again. And what is the result? What we are supposed to be getting from Ramadan, we are not getting. <clears throat> so we have to ask ourselves, why? Why aren't we getting from Ramadan what we're supposed to get? The bottom line is the heart. The bottom line is the heart. Because we have not purified our hearts. We have not prepared ourselves for Ramadan. We just bumble into Ramadan every year and we do the same things we do and we come back out. We have not prepared everything else that we do in life, which is of importance, we prepare for it. Hmm? Isn't it? Everything else that we do, we consider to be important in our lives. We make preparation. But Ramadan we don't prepare for. It just comes in, or what is our preparation? Material things. Isn't it? We buy up all these foods and you know, all the focus is on all the sweets and the foods we're going to have in Ramadan and you know. So Ramadan, for most of us, is a month-long party. You know, it's a month-long party. We're just partying from the first Ramadan till the last day, including the Eid. It's just party. The food and the, you know, visiting and the socializing and the, you know. Is that what Ramadan was for? Was that the way of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad in the early generation? Surely not. We spend the early part buying up all the foods, and in the last 10 days, for example, when we should be trying to catch Laylatul Qadr, we spend the last 10 days in the souk, in the shopping mall, buying clothes and things for Eid, presents and stuff and so on. So, we are unprepared, we don't have any plan as to how to deal with Ramadan, and our hearts are corrupted. We're coming into Ramadan without purifying the heart first. If we don't clean our hearts of the diseases that we've built up over the years, then how can the heart benefit from Ramadan? And this is what Ibn Taymiyyah is talking about in a general sense. But how can the heart benefit from the truth if it is corrupt? The heart has to be cleaned of corruption for it to be able to benefit from that sacred truth of Ramadan. So this is something we have to reflect on. That all of the diseases of the heart, we need to know them. We'll be studying aspects of them in, the, in our uh, study of this book of Ibn Taymiyyah. But 
we don't need to wait until we cover all of them you know then we look at them no we're going into Ramadan I would say that before we go into Ramadan we need to tackle them try to deal with them the basic ones which everybody knows jealousy hatred you know pride greed the love of material things that we're talking about the material world you know these basic uh, desires for things the forbidden things that we find so attractive the one tree in the whole garden the whole garden of halal but the one tree becomes most desirable you know, this is where we are so we need to clear the heart of these things tackle these things find the treatment for these purify ourselves of these things and then plan Ramadan properly that Ramadan should not be different in terms of our eating pattern than the rest of the year it shouldn't be as one uh, person pointed out some non-Muslims actually a number of them have pointed out that you all in Ramadan you turn the day into the night and the night into the day you sleep all day and you're up all night <laughs> what, what, what is the value of this fasting? or as one brother was interested in Islam recently just told me a few days back that uh, you know you people when they're fasting I see people they fast all day and then they break their fast with a cigarette I mean something which is clearly haram you fast all day and you break the fast with a cigarette it's like breaking the fast with a glass of alcohol cigarettes are even more dangerous than alcohol more clearly haram they kill cause cancer people die from it so it means that the fast for most people is just a cultural affair as we said a month-long party socializing and all these different things but it shouldn't be it should be a month of ibadah the month of Quran reading the Quran regularly we should read the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which talk about the merits of Ramadan and we should read the Quran at every opportunity that we have and we should avoid the distractions things which will distract us from our ibadah so for example for women rather than because when you socialize you have people over all these people are invited over what does that do for your wife in Ramadan she spends all day cooking from the morning till the evening people come they eat and then she spends the night washing cleaning up after so where is her ibadah what happened to her ibadah so it shouldn't be feed the poor this is what the feeding in Ramadan should be about feed those who are needy who don't have enough feed the poor this is where our focus should be rather than turning it into a social affair you know so much so that a year or so back uh, Bush had a iftar party for Muslim leaders in the White House yeah this is what, this is what breaking the fast has become a party so even Bush Clinton before him did the same a joke this is a joke so we need to tackle Ramadan as it should be tackled going into the fast with light meals light suhoor not a three course biryani and mutton and you know meal so that we're filled to the brim our systems are digesting the food all the way up until Maghrib when it finally finishes just before the Adhan the Adhan comes ready to fill it up again you know, this is the this is our process and the breaking of the fast is the test of the fast people think that the, the real test is to not eat and drink during the yes there's a test there but the biggest test is not to overeat afterwards all the doctors put out, I know in the Emirates, I don't know if it happens here, but before every Ramadan, there are doctors' uh, advices that come in that last couple of weeks, warning people against overeating. Okay. Because so many cases of people ending up in the hospital from overeating during Ramadan. And these are not the non-Muslims. These are the Muslims. 
you know. Muslims who come out of Ramadan 5, 10 kilos heavier than on Muslims are one <laughs> you're fasting for 30 days and you come out 10 kilos heavier, what happened to you? You know, what kind of fast was that? Well, this is the state we're in, that we look at Ramadan seriously and follow the Ramadan of the Prophet As he said, pray as you saw me pray. He said, hajj as you see me hajj. We should fast as we know he fasted. Break our fast the way he did. So we get the benefit from the fast. So we need to tackle, on one hand, our hearts, purify it of those diseases. We know the sicknesses of the hearts, which will affect our ability to benefit from Ramadan. Then we need to prepare ourselves going into Ramadan, make some uh, program for ourselves in Ramadan that we're going to stick to. It's a time of dua. Make duas before we go into Ramadan. Make a list of duas, 30 duas, before we go into the month. 30 duas for key things that we know are critical in our lives. We really need these things, 30 of them. And each day, focus on that particular dua. As well as other duas, but use that, make that a focal point besides the Quran, between the Quranic readings. Focus on that dua. And each day, shift from dua to dua. You know, take benefit. Because usually, unfortunately for ourselves, we end up only making dua when? When calamity strikes. When we have a big problem, this is when we're making all the duas. Very sincere, deep duas. But as soon as it's lifted, then we're back to our usual way. So brothers, that was just brief advice uh, for Ramadan. And uh, I hope, inshallah, that we'll take it to heart. Tackle our hearts in Ramadan, prepare ourselves properly for Ramadan that we may get the benefit which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, prescribed for us in Ramadan. Because surely He didn't make Ramadan because He needed it. It's we who need Ramadan. Uh, I think it's almost time for Salat al Isha. Just a point uh, next week, uh, if we can start, if it's not a problem. To start at 5.30 instead, we can start earlier. Um, is there anybody who has a problem coming at 5.30 on Friday? That because Maghrib is earlier, much earlier. So we stay, we can start half an hour earlier, then at least we can allow half an hour for questions and answers to finish off the last class before Ramadan. In Ramadan we will continue, but it will be from 4 o'clock instead, before Iftar. And Iftar will be here for both the sisters and brothers here in the center, his star will be prepared, right? And in fact, next week after the uh, class, we should have a meal before we go into Ramadan together, inshallah. Just as a means of uh, socializing for the sake of Allah, you know, we looked at uh, some dhikr, some remembrance of Allah in the book, and inshallah we can meet over a meal and also uh, get to know each other a little better because I think many of you come in and go and you don't even know, know who your neighbor is. Uh, inshallah. So, subhanakallahu wa bihamdika, inshallah, ilaha ad, astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. You say that.